One of the more interesting aspects of Naruto isn't always the techniques, or the thrill of the fight, or even the dialogue and interactions between characters. While all of these things working in tandem makes this series legendary, what I always found myself captivated by was the characterization of each individual character. To compare two different characters together and see the similarities and differences. Like between Madara and Sasuke, one is consumed by love, the other consumed by hatred. Both attempt to destroy the village. Their goals are different, yet similar. Both wish to destroy a way of life to end suffering. For Sasuke, that was destroying the system that killed his brother to foster peace under a one-world dictatorial regime centered around himself. Madara wished to retreat into a world of dreams with the rest of the world to make everyone happy, to have the things they dreamed of. But above all, my favorite characterizations were ones centered around Naruto. Obito Uchiha, Nagato Uzumaki, Gara. all of these characterizations were pure gold. When we saw these things, we weren't seeing Naruto facing an antagonist, it was more than that. We were witnessing Naruto facing himself, a different part of him, another path, the all-powerful one who wishes to bring peace at any cost, the one who was left behind just trying to piece together a world without loneliness. The one that had been discarded and abused, becoming the abuser. The beauty of Naruto's story was that the world deals you cards, and sometimes those cards aren't the best. Sometimes the cards you get are flops, but each of us have no choice but to play them. Some will try to cheat, some will try to bluff, some will fold. But in the end, there will be some who play their cards out to the end, merely believing that the future will bring them a full house. Why am I saying all of this? Because the dynamic between Nagato and Naruto, obvious beyond words, is still one of the best dynamics in the series. So it makes me wonder, what if Naruto were in Nagato's position? What if he were there? What if the three Ame orphans became four? How would things have changed? Would they have changed? Would Naruto have changed things? Or would things have changed Naruto? Let's take a look now, shall we? Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. We've noticed that a lot of people who do enjoy our videos aren't actually subscribed to our channel. This is probably because YouTube is really good at recommending our stuff to you, but if you want to support the Amagi and see lots more videos like this, please click that subscribe button. Thanks so much. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. It was raining. The ground was cold and muddy. Two tiny bare feet, caked in dirt and now accumulating mud, trudged through. Where were they going? What was the goal of this trial? Where was the destination? Perhaps they weren't marching anywhere. Perhaps reason had left these tiny feet. They just moved. Forward. Wherever forward was, that's where they were going. A set of eyes, rings echoing out from the pupil, looked up as the precipitation dropped from the clouds. There was a blur in his vision as water dripped down upon these Rinnegan. These eyes had seen much suffering. Over a century of bloodshed, death, and destruction. It seemed these eyes could only witness darkness. It was as if these Rinnegan were cursed, the reincarnation of the Sage of Six Paths his parents had said when he spontaneously developed them one day. Awakening one day as an infant, suddenly he saw the world in a different light, and ever since, it seemed a pale blue shade was cast upon everything. The pale moments of sunshine between deluges seemed sad. The times he laughed with his parents now seemed bitter, momentary. Nagato's stomach hadn't growled in a long time. He had gone a while in pain, crying out for food, then suddenly he felt sick. Finally, there was indifference. He couldn't feel anything anymore, only crippling tiredness, weakness. Those small, mud-caked feet trudged along, moving forward into the future. A short future. Life had dealt its cruel hand to one so innocent and defenseless. The coldness of the air, the bitter chill brought on by the rain. Whatever energy was left to burn was burnt while his body shivered. He looked up to the sky and thought he saw his parents looking down upon him. Before him, he witnessed the Shinigami his parents had told him stories of, the Reaper. It bore a dagger in its mouth, but its terrifying expression softened a bit as Nagato's feet stumbled closer. There was no longer fear in his heart. The Reaper pulled the dagger from its mouth and placed it into a sheath. Only kindness was found in its eyes. A sweet mercy. Death was a mercy. It came closer to him slowly as he walked to meet it, and then suddenly he hit his knees and let out a labored breath before falling into the mud. His eyes half open, he wanted to move, but his feet could not move anymore. The rain fell without care. 
the mud sank, ready to accept him into the soil to return his body to the dirt from which it came. His breathing was short and light. He heard the steps drawing closer. The steps stopped right before him, looking down. Shinigami, I want to see my mama and daddy again. Take me to them, Shinigami. His eyes began to close when suddenly a hand reached down and gripped his. Nagato opened his eyes to look at it. The hand was not the ghostly hand of the Reaper, no. They were small hands. I think he's still alive, a voice said. Help me get him up. He felt a set. No, two. Three? Three sets of hands roll him over onto his back. He saw three heads, one possessing violet hair, another with orange hair, and a third head, this one with yellow. Once he was up, he felt his arms wrapping around the shoulders of two his size. Now those feet that once trudged through the mud were being dragged across it. His eyes opened just enough to see the worried expression of a girl who was as of now attempting to clean off his eyelids so he could see. We gotta get him home, one of the voices said. If he doesn't eat, he's gonna die. Another voice then chimed in, the voice of a girl. Do we have enough to give him? We can barely feed ourselves. Do we even have anything to give him? The third voice spoke. I don't care if I have to go without food today, I'm going to give him something to eat. Nagato would have smiled if he had the energy to do so, but he didn't. His eyes closed and whatever tension was left in his shoulders left him. For a moment, he saw a light and heard voices talking far away. He wanted to walk into that light, but two voices from within bid him to return, telling him that his time wasn't here. He still had many great things yet to do. A woman's voice. Mom. She told him to be strong. To fight. Don't give in and he'd survive. He felt the warmth of a hand on his face, though he saw nobody, and a simple kiss on the cheek. His eyes began to open. He felt that hand on his cheek again, but it wasn't his mother. No, it was a girl his age. She was sitting behind him, holding him up. There was a crackling sound as the fire popped. Two figures walked over and knelt down. Here, take this. A spoon stirred around in a simple bowl. Cracked and slightly dirty, but still good enough to hold food. The meal wasn't much, and it wasn't seasoned at all. It was nothing more than stale bread soaked in milk and warmed over a fire. As simple as the meal was, the taste was as if it were the best thing he had ever eaten. Tears rolled down his cheeks with every bite. One of the boys spoke after a long pause to state a terrifying fact. We're out of food. What do we do? A longer pause. We get more food, the third voice said. It's not hard. There are a lot of people in the city. They're not all starving, so that means that they have a lot of it. So let's just go get it. We don't have any money, though, the girl spoke. So what, the boy retorted. We steal it. The girl was appalled. But stealing is wrong. The boy scoffed. Killing is wrong. Our parents were killed because of fighting and we're in this position now because of it. A lot of things are wrong, but you know what's wronger? Letting him die because he didn't have food. The other boy agreed. We'll only take what we need. I'm sure they can share. Okay. If it's to save our new friend's life, I say we take some food. Nagato assumed that this is what they did. He was once again eating, so maybe they stole the food. Between bouts of sleep and bouts of eating, Nagato's strength was returning to him. Eventually, his eyes opened enough to see. When that happened, the three gathered around to look. There was a boy wearing goggles, and a boy with a massive smile. There was also a girl there with the calmest smile and an origami rose in her hair. He's awake, the blonde boy shouted in happiness. The lavender-haired girl gasped. Look at his eyes. They're so pretty. They then spoke to him. Perhaps we should introduce ourselves, the orange-haired boy said. My name is Yahiko. He then pointed to the blonde boy who was still beaming a smile. That's Naruto. And then he pointed over to the lavender-haired girl. And that's Conan. He looked back at Nagato and spoke out. Who are you? Nagato's mouth opened as he attempted to speak, but no words came out. Conan smiled. It's okay. Don't force yourself. We can wait. They continued to feed him and nurse him back to health with whatever they could get a hold of and the tender care of three friends who had decided to adopt a new little brother. Thankfully, he was eventually strong enough to eat solid foods on his own and even hold himself up. It was then that he introduced himself as Nagato, Nagato Uzumaki. Hey, that's my clan's name too, Naruto shouted out in his ever boisterous nature. Nagato was surprised at first, but then he smiled. Yahiko looked back. I guess that makes you two real family. Naruto looked to him. We're all family now. Nagato continued to watch. It was then that Nagato realized that Naruto, and possibly even Yahiko and Konin, had been sacrificing meals just to get him back to health. This brought tears to the boy's eyes. Naruto looked back. Uh-oh, he sprung a leak. Nagato profusely thanked Naruto over and over again. Naruto would just hug onto him. It's what friends are for. But we didn't even know each other when you saved me. How are we friends? Naruto laughed. Because everyone's just a friend you haven't met yet. And now we've met, and I think it was worth it. This sent Nagato back into a fit of tears. 
more and more Nagato continued to eat and regain his strength. Eventually, he was even capable of standing and walking again. More importantly, he was capable of running, which is what they had to do quite often to keep feeding themselves. Eventually though, the four of them realized that things would need to change. They would need to get work in any way that they could. They couldn't just steal forever. Eventually, they would get caught. And in this era, there was no law. And as such, justice was something that someone took for themselves. Having seen no mercy thus far, they knew that should they get captured, it would lead to their likely demise. After all, nobody cared about unproductive children. They were considered parasites. But for the time being, they enjoyed their meals as they valiantly faced the world and attempted to deal with the cards they were dealt. As they ate, they spoke. Where did you come from, Nagato? He looked up. I came from the outskirts. Conan smiled. What was your life like before this? Nagato thought about it. My dad was a doctor and my mom was a nurse. They both wanted to help people and make them better when they were hurt. When the fighting began, they worked really hard to heal people who'd been hurt, no matter what side they were on. Naruto nodded. Your parents were really nice. Nagato continued. One night, the fighting continued and we were hiding in the dark when Ninja broke into our house. Yahiko held up his hand. It's okay, Nagato. We don't need to drag up bad memories. Let's just remember the good stuff for now. My father was a salesman, a grocer. That's why I know how to steal well from vendors. Conan then spoke. My dad was a farmer. I think he worked with Yahiko's dad. I guess that's why he was able to find me easily. They all looked to Naruto, the enigma of the group. He looked around. Huh, me? Oh, I was always an orphan. I never knew my parents. I guess nobody wanted me. The collective mood of the group suddenly lowered and Naruto sensed it. It didn't really affect him any though, so why should they care? He smiled. Just like Yahiko didn't want you, Nagato. He was like, we can't feed him, let's just leave him. Naruto laughed. Yahiko punched him in the arm. Don't say things like that, Naruto. Naruto just laughed harder. Yahiko looked back. Nagato smiled. Yahiko sighed and leaned back, reclining against the wall of the cave they called home. Still, war sucks. It's because of all their fighting that we're even in this mess. We could all have been happy and with our parents. Well, I mean, almost all of us. Naruto would be no different. Sorry, Naruto. Naruto waved it off. Yahiko continued, I hate war. He looked out the mouth of the cave at the sun as it set on the horizon. One day, I'm going to get enough power. Either physical or political, I'm going to stop all wars. Nagato looked out of the cave towards the sunset and smiled. That was a dream worth having. That night, all four of the orphans curled up together to sleep, sharing body heat by the dwindling fire to stave off the cold. Surely they had nothing, but what they did have, they shared and each did their part. The bonds of brotherhood made every crumb feel like a full feast, and though they had no beds or blankets, they still cuddled. As hellish as their lives were, they each were the silver lining to the other's dark clouds. That made their lives bearable, and they would fight so hard to feed each other, and the conviction of friendship made them even more effective, to the point where the four of them gained a little bit of a reputation among the villagers. Some people would leave out old food for them, others would chase them off. But the fact that they all survived was a feat that they could only owe to God and the bonds of a second family that he had blessed them with. And once more, they had to be taught a hard truth about the world, as if they hadn't been taught it already. The Leaf were attacking Ame, and this led to a massive battle between the two. It was at this point that the legendary leader of Ame, Hanzo of the Salamander, actually took the stage and stole the show. The ones who would later become known as Sanin and sages in their own rights were facing off against Hanzo. It was during this time that the orphan's puppy, Chibi, was fatally wounded and died. This weighed heavily on their hearts. That night, as they slept, the ground felt extraordinarily hard. The four would later find themselves following these three leaf ninja. They sort of stalked the Sanin aways until the three came to a rest. Orochimaru kept guard, looking out from the cave that they were hiding in, all while Tsunade rested. Jiraiya was busy getting something to eat. The Konoha Nin seemed slightly calm by this point. Cautious, but calm. The kids watched on when suddenly the three tensed up. We're being watched. Three targets. No, four, Orochimaru spoke. He drew his kunai, ready to strike them down. Jiraiya stopped him. No, they're just kids. Orochimaru looked back at his comrade. His face was questioning, either asking, are you sure, or does that matter? Tsunade cut through the silence by demanding that they come out of hiding. Yahiko, the leader of the group, steps out first. Give us some food, he said bluntly. Where are your parents? Jiraiya asked him. Yahiko stood silent for a moment. They're dead. They were killed in the war. Jiraiya was silent for a moment longer. He held out his hand, offering up his rations to them. The three others appeared from behind the shadows and ran up to Jiraiya to take the crackers. This wasn't really about food, though. They could steal food at any time. 
but what this had really been about was a not so elaborate plan to see if these shinobi were kind enough. That's why Yahiko was the first and only to make his appearance until it could be verified that there was no threat. Life had taught these kids about duty to your friends, sacrifice, sharing, and teamwork. But saddest of all, it taught the children that you could never trust anyone. And as it seemed, these three passed. They sort of hung out with the shinobi for a time, but eventually the extra company grew uncomfortable, so the three decided to prepare to leave. However, as they left through the rain, the pitter-patter of eight tiny feet behind them could be heard. Tsunade, ever the one to grow irritated first, turned around and demanded to know why they were following them. More food? They were fresh out. So what did they hope to gain from it? Jiraiya held out his hand to stop her. His mind was open and his empathy was clear. He pointed to the little lavender-haired girl who bore in her hands a single rose made of origami paper. She presented it to Tsunade. Thank you so much for before. It was then that the blunt Yahiko spoke up. You're Konohanin, aren't you? The statement startled the Sanin, and in return, Orochimaru stepped forward. Shall I kill them? That statement sent a shiver down each of the children's spines. Jiraiya held out his hand again, demanding that Orochimaru stop. He relented. He told him and Tsunade to go on ahead, and that he would stay behind with the children. This surprised his group, but they accepted. This was the beginning of something beautiful. A new friendship. A mentorship. A man who was more than a teacher. A man who was like a father to them. That made them feel like a real family. And though they lost their puppy, they gained something new. Something that would change their lives forever. Jiraiya found them a little place to live. A home that they did up to their liking. He many times would teach them new skills. Yahiko so desperately wanted to learn ninjutsu, but Jiraiya was of the mind that they should remain peaceful. He didn't want to teach them any of these skills, only for them to be swept up in the wars and killed. He didn't wish to have to face them in battle one day and possibly kill them. So he told them that the most important skill for any shinobi was to learn how to take care of themselves, how to feed themselves, and how to stay safe behind enemy lines. And to that end, he taught them how to fish, how to hunt, how to cook and look after themselves. On top of that, he taught them a unique trick, a security system of sorts. He set up five cards and explained to them all while wearing a frog suit. His students were also wearing frog suits. Conan seemed less than happy with it. Yahiko didn't really care. Nagato was content, willing to learn no matter what he was wearing, captivated by every work Jiraiya spoke, and Naruto seemed to enjoy the frog suit more than the lesson. But anyway, Jiraiya taught them that when they were home, they should flip the card around to show it, and when they were gone, they should turn the cards around to let the others know, so that if anyone came into the house and began messing around and the cards weren't turned around, then they should assume it's a break-in and be ready to run. The four of them were provided beds to sleep on. It had been so long since any of them had slept in beds, under covers with pillows. Despite the fact that they no longer needed to, these four slept in the same room together. They were stuck like glue, and Jiraiya found it endearing. In the darkness, as the light from the moon shined in, the four laid in bed. Mr. Jiraiya's really nice, isn't he? Nagato said. Naruto looked over. Yeah, I've never seen anyone so nice before. Is this what it feels like to be in a big family? Yahiko looked over at them. Yeah, but I wish you would finally teach us ninjutsu. I already know this stuff. Conan was already half asleep. Nagato spoke in reply to Yahiko. Mr. Jiraiya said that it's important for Shinobi to take care of themselves. This is probably the basics before he actually teaches us. Yahiko sighed. I hope so. They continued to sleep. The day after, they ventured into town to find more food. It was there that they became separated from Jiraiya. To their horror, they were found by an Iwanin. The Iwanin attacked them. They attempted to defend themselves, but what could they do? They were just children against a fully trained ninja, a Chunin likely. But Naruto did give up. When the Iwanin came for Conan, he jumped in the way and took the strike to his head and was knocked into a building with enough force to break the siding. Naruto would see the blood dripping from Naruto's head and scream out at the Chunin. The Iwanin at first didn't understand, but then his face showed something different. His body swelled for a moment before suddenly bursting into a rainstorm of blood and guts. Conan screamed in terror as the event took place. Jiraiya ran as fast as he could to get to them. He saw the scene, the blood. Conan on the ground with Yahiko by her side, and Naruto still slumped against the wall. Jiraiya ran to Nagato and knelt down. What happened? Nagato just looked on and could barely formulate words. I... I killed him. I killed... that man. The ninja. Jiraiya ran to Conan and looked to her. Is she okay? He asked Yahiko. Yahiko nodded. Yeah, she's just scared. He nodded and moved to Naruto. He pulled Naruto from the siding and held him. Naruto! Naruto! Are you okay? There was a pulse, but he was unconscious and blood was dripping from his brow. He lifted him up. We should go home. Yahiko helped Conan and together they all went home. They waited outside as Jiraiya tended to Naruto in the kid's room. Thankfully, it just seemed to be a minor concussion and he elected to allow him to rest. He cleaned the blood from his face and wrapped his head up. All the while, outside, Nagato sat there. 
Conan had a thousand yard stare as she looked into the ground. Yahiko was sitting by her. Nagato looked at her. Conan, are you okay? Her eyes cut to him and she slowly started to cry again as she hid her face in Yahiko's shoulder. Nagato's eyes began to run with tears as he realized he had mentally scarred her. He stood and walked out, flipping his car around, stepping out into the night. Once Jiraiya was finished, he stepped out and looked around. Where's Nagato? Yahiko, still comforting Conan, spoke. He left. I don't know where he went. Jiraiya saw the card. Didn't you try stopping him? Yahiko looked up. I was too scared to. Jiraiya looked down at the children and then stepped out as well. He jumped through the trees from limb to limb. Nagato, he called out. He would stop when he saw a little river flowing calmly across a bed of rocks. On the shore near it was the boy with the cherry-colored hair. Jiraiya hopped down behind him and saw the boy curled into a ball, just sitting there. Jiraiya stepped closer. Nagato? The closer he came, the more he heard it. Sniffling, the sound of muffled tears. He walked over and knelt down. Nagato, are you okay? Nagato shook his head. Conan and Yahiko won't talk to me anymore. He looked up as tears dripped from the Rinnegan. It was an accident. I didn't mean to kill him. Jiraiya nodded. I know. The guilt isn't on you. He attacked you first and you defended your friends. That is not evil, Nagato. It's not wrong. Nagato shook his head. No, I killed him by accident. I didn't mean to do that to him. It all just happened. What if I accidentally do it to Konin, Yahiko, or Naruto? Jiraiya looked down at him. Nagato continued. What if I do it to you? Jiraiya shook his head. You won't. Those were special circumstances. He looked into the boy's eyes. These are your powers, Nagato. Nagato hit his face again. I wish they weren't. I wish I didn't have them anymore. I don't care if I lose them just so long as I get to stay friends with the others. Jiraiya pulled him into a hug. Nagato, if you're scared of your powers, then you need to control them. I'll help. Your powers are a good thing. You can do so much with them. Change the world. Nagato looked up again and listened. You're meant for more than this. You have so many great things to do. I'll tell you something. I finally realized it. You possess the Rinnegan. The what? Nagato asked. Jiraiya smiled. The Rinnegan. It's known to be the greatest of all dojutsu, and it was the particular dojutsu of the Sage of Six Paths. Only one other before you and after the Sage possessed the Rinnegan. It leads me to believe that you are the third incarnation of the Sage of Six Paths. That means that if you wish to bring peace, you can. I'll protect you. I won't let you end up in a situation like that again. Not unprepared. I'll teach you and your friends to use ninjutsu. He would walk back with Nagato in his arms and enter the house. He then flipped Nagato's card around to signify that the boy was returned to them. He sat him down. Nagato hid his face from the others. It didn't take long though. A family is a family no matter what. Slowly, Conan crawled over to snuggle up to him. Yahiko wasn't far behind. In this way, their embrace of him told Nagato that everything would be okay. They wouldn't abandon him. They wouldn't let him lose his second family. As Conan hugged him, she spoke. Thank you for protecting me. Jiraiya watched on and informed them of his desire to finally teach them ninjutsu. This very much excited Yahiko. He told them to sleep well and that in the morning he'd proceed to teach them, and that is exactly what he did. And when Naruto was well enough to join in, he did too. It was also during this time that Jiraiya noticed it for the first time. The Nine Tails, he asked himself in surprise. He had known that the tailed beasts had been bartered away by Hashirama Senju in the past, but he hadn't realized that he bartered away the Nine Tails. Or had he? Jiraiya thought he had it sealed into Mito Uzumaki. He proceeded to ask Naruto about it, who explained that he was indeed an Uzumaki, despite the fact that he possessed blonde hair. Jiraiya wondered how he had gotten out here with it, to which no answer was given. He knew that as a Konoha nin, it was his duty to bring Naruto back to Konoha and restore the Nine Tails to his village. However, the longer he thought about it, the more he came to realize his duties stood above Konoha only. He had been informed in the past by the Toad Sages that Jiraiya would one day come to mentor a child of prophecy, one who would reunite all nine beasts. Jiraiya believed that Nagato was indeed the child of prophecy, and Naruto's appearance near him caused him to wonder if it were possible. So he began teaching Naruto to harness his Nine Tails powers. However, this was easier said than done. Naruto wasn't very skilled with jutsu, not when compared to Nagato who picked up every jutsu he was ever shown after only ever seeing it once. But Jiraiya didn't give up. He taught them everything he could, including the Rasengan. Each one he had mastered it during their training. It was a difficult jutsu to learn, but was integral to passing his own list of tests before he felt they were ready to forge out on their own. He knew that if they mastered the Rasengan, it meant that they had control over their chakra to a fine enough point that they could potentially master any jutsu and so each one he taught. Once more, Nagato was the first to master it, although he failed quite a few times. 
This was followed by Conan and Yahiko, and finally Naruto. Once Naruto mastered this, he also taught him how to make use of his version 1 cloak. He later attempted to teach Naruto how to use version 2, but such a technique was so taxing on him mentally that he was unable to do it. And so he believed that version 1 would be good for the time being until he could properly manage his emotions. Jiraiya had given him the starting tools, the same as he had with the other orphans. He remained with them for approximately three years, and at the end of those years, he stood before them. I've taught you all I know. I've given you every tool required to become Shinobi, and even taught you one of my most prized and difficult jutsu, the Rasengan. I believe you're ready for my final test. You have to defeat me in battle. Yahiko was shocked. Defeat you, Jiraiya-sensei. Jiraiya smiled. Well, not me exactly. Try this. He created a shadow clone of himself. This clone possesses all of my skills and techniques. It possesses my strength, but its durability is... Eh. He looked to them. Deal enough damage to this and you will defeat it. If you defeat it, I feel like you're ready for the real world. The four students nod their heads. With a flicker of their bodies, they were all gone, including the clone. In the trees, they jump and chase after the clone, Naruto in his version 1 cloak, the others chasing after as well. Nagato keeps his eyes open, searching the area for any traps and keeping track of the Jiraiya clone. Naruto, careful, there's an explosive kunai on the next branch. Dodge it. Naruto hears and uses his fox-like claws to hop into the trees above, jumping from limb to limb while upside down. They continue to chase the clone until they land in a clearing. The clone of Jiraiya summons a clone of Gamabunta, which pulls its massive dagger and attempts to strike them. They narrowly dodge, all except Conan, who allows herself to be struck by the blade. As the blade makes contact, though, her body splits apart into paper, proving to have always been a paper clone. And what's more, those pieces of paper she turned into are revealed to be paper bombs, which attach to the blade and destroy it. Gamabunta continues to use his water style until eventually he corners them. The clone of Jiraiya seems disappointed. But before he can say anything, from behind, Naruto rushes in with a Rasengan. He plants the orb into his master's back, causing an explosion. The Jiraiya clone lands and turns to a puff of smoke as the clone of Gamabunta does the same. It was revealed that they had only been targeting a clone of Naruto, and that the real one snuck up from behind. It was then that the real Jiraiya appeared. Congratulations. I knew you could do it. Honestly, deep in my heart, I'd hope you'd fail. Because then it would mean that you'd still need me, but now I see. My presence is no longer needed. We'll always need you, Jiraiya-sensei, Naruto called out. Jiraiya smiled. Maybe, but the point remains. A tree cannot grow in the shadow of another tree. And for a bird to truly be free, it must eventually leave its nest and fly on its own. You four, I have seen you as my own children. I have loved you as my own and will continue to love you, but the time has come for you to fly. These three years have been some of the best of my life, and you've all inspired me. Nagato, with your undying kindness. Yahiko, with your undying determination. Conan, with your undying creativity and intelligence. And Naruto, with your undying enthusiasm. Surely you four have the makings of legendary shinobi, and one day I hope to be the one to write your story. You will make the world a better place. You can end war and bring hope and understanding to all hearts. Jiraiya stood there with them and decided that he would spend one final night with his pupils. The next day came and they all arose. They stepped outside to see Jiraiya off. In the distance, the light of the sun rose above the horizon as they tearfully wished their mentor goodbye. As they left, they returned inside and turned his card around to say that he had left, but in hopes that one day he might return. They looked to each other and nodded. Having marked themselves as out, just as they had Jiraiya, each one hoped in their heart that all those cards might one day, once again, be turned to show that they were there. As they stepped out, Naruto took one last look at the interior and smiled before closing the door for the final time. He turned to the others. The sun was rising. It was daybreak. With hope in their hearts for a better future, they forged ahead into the unknown. Into the sunrise. Into the daybreak. Into the Akatsuki. The rain continued to fall. The sun had gone down. Not that it made much of a difference, but all the same, it was nighttime. They were looking over a rather small village. Naruto in the trees, Yahiko on the ground. Conan was with those gathered within for protection and defense, and Nagato was on a rooftop. This poor, tiny village had been sacked over three times in one month. Being that Amegakure and the surrounding area were all flanked by Shinobi Nation, such a village had often been attacked itself by the Hidden Stone, who needed more resources to keep the war going. In fear, this tiny village reached out to buy help with its meager funds. Maybe it couldn't hire big-name elite Shinobi, but they would take whatever they could get at this time. They were tired of their tiny village being the source of fighting. So many innocent men, women, and children had been killed or starved because they either resisted or didn't resist. An entire way of life was on the line, and those who could do something about it didn't. And so that's where they were now. That was the state of things. There was never a job too small for the Akatsuki. 
The smaller the village, the tougher the work and the less the reward. But someone had to defend the weak, and that was the M.O. of the Akatsuki. If they couldn't bring peace to a simple village caught between warring nations, how could they ever hope to save the world and bring peace? They kept guard. Word had come in that another raid was on its way, so our modest little group of heroes for hire simply waited, offering fortification and defense, preparing for what was to come. So far, they seemed like they were ready. Nagato kept his eyes on the horizon to see if any were coming. Conan was on the ground, and Yahiko would be the olive branch extended to the raiders. Naruto, though, he was what came when that olive branch was rejected. Paper bombs, shuriken, and crossbows, he had them all set up as traps around the village, connected by a massive fishing line that he held in his hand. In the distance, he heard a distinct whistle that came from Nagato. This was the signal. He'd seen something, likely the oncoming threat. He got into position, ready to fight. Yahiko merely stood there, waiting. Suddenly, the men showed up. Yahiko stepped forward. Really? This is your fourth attempt in three days. Every time we've sent you and your crew packing. Why do you keep doing this, Kyusuke? The shinobi scoffed. We need food. They have food. It's simple, really. Yahiko shook his head. No, I'm talking about continuing to return and cause trouble even when we show up to defeat you. The shinobi remained silent, merely pulling out a weapon with which to strike back with. Yahiko sighed. Are you really going to force us to do this again? Kyusuke nodded. I will. Every day until I get what I want. Yahiko looked to Nagato, who would once more whistle, this time a different signal. Every projectile, every crossbow, every shuriken all converged on the location of the enemy as a smoke bomb activated below their feet and blurred their vision. The weapons went in. It wasn't even a close battle. They all hit the ground. As the smoke faded, the enemy was defeated. Yahiko came down to their side. None of the attacks were lethal, and that was thanks to his own design, but they were incapacitated. Why do you keep doing this to yourself? Why not leave the village alone? Kyusuke growled. Because we need the food. Yahiko raised a brow. You're going hungry. Kyusuke nodded. If you're gonna kill us, then do so now. Because if you don't, we'll keep coming back here every day until we get what we want. Yahiko smiled. Then I'll be here. I'll do this with you every day I have to in perpetuity. And when I defeat you then, I'll spare you, just as I'm doing now. They began to remove their various kunai and shuriken. He then handed them tools to properly care for their wounds. If you truly have nothing, then take this. Don't let yourselves get sick. Kyusuke took the first aid kit and looked up questionably, his heart unable to understand why this man was the way he was. How could one be so kind? How could one refuse to kill even though the threat would return endlessly? It made no sense to him. As if sensing what this man was thinking, Yahiko spoke. Peace is something achieved by peacefulness. War brings ruin and hatred, and hatred is the enemy of peace. I will spread love through strength, and I will bring peace to the world by example. So if you must return every day, then at least heal your wounds before you try again. I don't want you dying for this. The group left. Yahiko breathed a sigh of relief. He turned around and began to head back to the building where Conan and the citizens were holed up. He stepped in and sat down with a sigh of relief. Well, that should buy us at least one day. Naruto popped in as well. I guess it really is sad. They just want to eat, Naruto said. Yahiko looked up. Yeah, that's true, but they are attempting to steal it after all. Conan looked back. Were we so different? Yahiko couldn't retort as she made a good point. He merely reclined against the back of his chair. He looked to the villagers. Do you believe that we could spare some food for them? The villagers shook their head. As much as we would like to help those in need, we're barely capable of feeding ourselves. Maybe if they helped work the land. Yahiko thought about it. As much as they've attacked you, if they apologize and attempt to join the village, would you accept them? The village elder thought for a moment. Because of their actions, many of our citizens died. I do not know if we can safely let them into the village, even if they do help. Yahiko sighed. What a bother. He couldn't blame the villagers, but at the same time, he could only barely blame the raiders. They had no food and were fighting to live. When society failed, humanity always reverted back to the laws of the wild, in which it was eat or be eaten, kill or be killed. And that's what was happening here. The five great shinobi nations were breaking down, and the people below them were suffering for it. As Yahiko rested for a few hours though, he was suddenly startled from his doze by the loud whistling of Nagato. Yahiko stood. What? Already? He stepped out of the village and into the opening as the village elders steered everyone towards their safe place. Yahiko walked out to meet them. Are you even in any condition to continue this? Yahiko asked. But to his surprise, Kyusuke spoke. No, we're not. We've reached a consensus. Your views of the world have inspired us. Please, forgive us for what we've done. We beg you. We also wish to bring peace to the world and leave our days of banditry behind. Yahiko was startled by this show of fealty. Please, let us join you. Your vision for the world is something we can all agree that's what we desire as well. We've lived our lives aimlessly, only serving ourselves and the unworthy. 
please, let us work in service to your dream that we would like so desperately to see come to pass. Please. Naruto sees the display before him and questions it. What's going on here? Yahiko would go on to explain it to them all. Conan listens. She's slightly skeptical, but both Naruto and Nagato agree that this is worth considering. Yahiko looks to them. So, what do you say? Should we let them join? Slowly, Naruto raises a thumb up. Yahiko looks to Nagato, who also raises his thumb in approval. Yahiko finally looks to Conan. The decision's up to you, Conan. I won't approve of this unless the entire team is comfortable with it. If you have any reservations, now's the time. It's gotta be unanimous. Should we let them join? Conan sits there for a moment and thinks about it, and remembers how they too once stole to survive, and how they had also killed to live. She thought deeply on it before finally lifting her thumb up as well. Yahiko smiled and lifted his thumb finally. He turned back to the others and spoke. We'll let you join us, but only on the condition that you leave your lawless lives behind and spend all of your waking moments selflessly giving yourself for others. Each new member nodded and accepted these terms. This was enough to make Yahiko break out into the widest grin. The village would go to pay the group for a job well done, but Yahiko would raise his hand and refuse it. He would say that they acquired something far greater than money. As they left the village, Conan asked if it was the right thing to do. If we get a reputation of always working for free, then nobody will pay us. Yahiko would look to her as they ran into the twilight of the rising sun. We're not doing this for money though. Perhaps not, but we still require it to live, Nagato said. Yahiko looked over, and so did they. Naruto chimed in from behind. It's a good thing, guys. Those people have problems, and they have the money and resources to pick themselves up off the ground. And they now have the same kindness in their hearts as we do, meaning it'll likely be paid forward. Yahiko laughed as Naruto understood perfectly. As they ran into the sunrise, Yahiko spoke. Guys, we just lit the opening sparks. Soon the whole world will be on fire, and it'll be burning a passionate red, a fire of love. We still don't have a proper name, Nagato said. Yahiko thought about it. He looked to Conan for inspiration. She merely stated a fact. You are our leader, Yahiko. We'll follow you wherever you lead. Yahiko looked forward. Then I'll lead you into the new dawn, daybreak. We'll call ourselves the Akatsuki. In that way, we'll never lose track of who we are or what we desire. Continuing to run, they let off a collective huzzah and prepared to pave the way for their future. They became well known far and wide as both an incredible paramilitary force and as a humanitarian aid group. The war-torn lands of the world were grateful for their help. That being said, the Akatsuki didn't stay only in Ame, but they went where they were needed. And currently, the number one place they needed to go was Kusagakure. Once there, they were taken in by the beauty of the village. Kuso was a beautiful place. Yahiko looked around though as he saw the wounded. It's sad. Kusa was actively trying to broker peace between Iwa and Konoha. It seems that their efforts fell through. The group made their way through the streets. They had been hired because something of incredible power had been taken. They made their way to the office of Zosui, the leader of Kusagakure. So, is this guy like the Kusakage? Naruto asked. Yahiko shrugged. Functionally, yes, but I don't actually recall if he calls himself that. They're led to the office and the door opens. There stands a man with short dark hair, a heavy build, sharp cheekbones, and a wide nose. He wastes no time getting to business, not even waiting for them to introduce themselves. Recently, we unearthed a relic of the ancient past. We had hidden it well, but Iwagakure found out about it and took it from us. The group that took the relic was led by General Nishikiyama. We sent a scout team after them. They should be about 15 clicks to the north. Find the commander and he'll fill you in on the mission. Get going. Yahiko had yet to lower his finger or even close his mouth from his attempt to talk. He slowly let out the breath he'd been holding in. Can you at least tell us what was taken from you? Anything at all? Zosui would turn back for only a moment. Didn't I tell you? The commander of the scout party I sent out will inform you of everything. Now go. Yahiko seemed less than thrilled to be talked at like this, but he held it in and turned to begin to leave. As they made their way out of the building, Naruto looked over at Yahiko. Do you plan to make Kusa pay for our help, Yahi? Yahiko scoffed. I'm going to make them pay up their rears. They rushed off, making their way into the direction that they were commanded. Finding camp, there was a small scuffle as it was unsure if they were truly the mercs that had been hired or if were merely spies for Iwa. But after clearing things up with the paper presented to them, they were escorted to the tent of Commander Kiryu. The commander appeared stern, yet there was something soft in his eyes. We're here for more information in regards to the mission. The commander nodded. About five days ago, an object of immense worth was stolen from us. We recently uncovered an artifact from the era of the Sage of Six Paths, known as the Kokuraku no Hako. The Box of Ultimate Bliss? Naruto asked. The commander nodded. We had believed it to only be of legend, and when it appeared in our dig sites, we were astounded. Word reached Iwa, and they sent one of their generals to take it by force. Nagato then began to ask important questions. What does this box do? Commander Kiryu then began to explain. In antiquity, it was believed that whoever possessed the box and opened it would have whatever they desired granted to them. Any wish, any desire. 
You know that's hogwash, right? Conan said. Dreams don't just come true because you open a box. The commander shrugged. If you had told me three months ago that the box of ultimate bliss existed, I would have said that was hogwash too. So you actually believe the story, Yahiko asked. I have no choice not to, the commander said. Even if it isn't true, it's still an important artifact from our past. And if it is true, then you don't want anyone having that. According to myth, Kusagakure nearly ruled the world with it about a thousand years ago. So if it's true in any capacity, it cannot be left in Iwa's hands. In fact, don't tell Zosui, but I personally think the box should be destroyed. Nobody needs that thing if it's a real weapon. Yahiko nodded. Alright, duly noted. Where can we find them? In a fortress, just beyond Kanabi Bridge. Do be careful though. That's where the heaviest fighting is located. They all thanked him for his help and began to rush off in the direction of Kanabi Bridge. As they did so, they passed through intense fighting. They attempted to steer clear, but there were times that they'd be spotted and would be chased by Konoha and Iwanin alike, but they always managed to get away. Eventually, they made it to the bridge and stopped only when they heard the sound of three voices. They couldn't make it out as they walked over the bridge, so they stayed vigilant. As they moved through, the voices subsided, which could be either very good or very bad. As they walked, they stopped when Naruto called out to them. What's this? Nagato walked over to where Naruto was and looked down off the side of the bridge. His face turned pale as his eyes widened. Bomb! Bomb! Get off the bridge! They turned and began to run towards the other side. Suddenly, before they could reach it, the explosives went off and the bridge began to collapse underneath them. They fell into the river below and were washed away. As they floated away, Yahiko could only remember the sound of water and the faint light of the sun shining down. His eyes opened up to see that he was beneath the waves. He quickly began to kick, swimming up to the surface where he took a deep breath. He wasn't alone though. He saw Conan under the waves as he came up, so he quickly dove back down and grabbed her hand. He swam upwards until they were both above water. Once they got to land, he pulled Conan a little further up. Yahiko sat there for a moment and tapped her cheeks, but there was no response. He listened to her chest only to hear nothing. He immediately felt panic. He took a deep breath and began to work. He angled her head up and began chest compressions. Please, Conan, you gotta do it. You can't die. That's an order. Wake up. He continued to perform CPR. Come on, wake up, wake up. Suddenly her eyes shot open and she vomited out water. She struggled to breathe. She sat there for a moment, just coughing and expelling water from her lungs. Tears dripped down her cheeks. Whether they were from fear or from strain, he didn't know, but he could just make it out despite the dripping of her hair. She took a deep breath and quivered as the breath let out in terror. She was crying out of fear. He pulled her into his embrace. It's okay. It's okay. I got you. I got you. She pressed against him as he wrapped his arms around her. He shushed her like a loving parent would, all while keeping his eyes peeled. There were no signs of enemies nearby. Conan raised her head up once she had finally managed to regain her bearings. Where's Nagato and Naruto? Yahiko looked around. No idea. Conan sat up. You don't think that they... Yahiko shook his head. No, it would take a lot more than a little water to keep them down. They're probably just out looking for us. We shouldn't keep them waiting. Yahiko stood. Let's make our way back to Kanabi Bridge, or whatever's left of it. So Yahiko and Conan began their trek back. On their way, they found Nagato. Yahiko sighed in relief. Ah, Nagato. You can't even begin to understand how happy I am to see you. Nagato would just walk over and embrace them both. Conan would look around. Where's Naruto? Nagato would look around. I thought he was with you. What, did he never surface? Yahiko stood there silently for a moment. What should we do? Conan asked. Looking to Yahiko, Nagato's eyes bore the same look in them. Yahiko then spoke. We'll continue on with the mission. Naruto knows where we're going. I have faith that he survived, and he's likely already heading there like Nagato was. We'll continue the mission and meet up with him either during it or after it. The three of them nodded, and so they made their way to Kanabi Bridge, where they stopped for a few minutes to look around and see if they could spot Naruto anywhere. But unfortunately, he was nowhere to be seen. Shoot, Yahiko said. Let's keep going. Maybe he's already at the fortress, or perhaps he went back to Kusa to meet up with us. Conan and Nagato's faces were both possessed by fear, and despite the optimism Yahiko was putting out, he too was terrified. But he had to have faith. They had a mission to accomplish, and they all knew the risks, and he had to maintain a level head to keep his other friends safe. So he led them on. Eventually, they found the fortress that Commander Kiryu had told them about. They began the process of recon. It was a large, walled complex with a big building in the middle. What do you see, Nagato? They asked their compatriot. Nagato looked down upon the complex from the mountainside they were on. Not much. There are some squads of Iwanin down there, but I can't see through walls or anything, so... Yahiko looked to him. Use your scouting technique. Nagato looked back and then to the sky. But there's not a single cloud in the sky. If I suddenly make it rain, people will probably get suspicious. Yahiko nodded in understanding, but he looked back to him. If Naruto's nearby, then you can use it to detect him. Nagato thought for a moment and nodded. Suddenly, as he weaved hand signs, it began to rain all across the area. 
As Nagato predicted, some of the shinobi thought it was strange that it would randomly start to rain, but unlike their prediction, these shinobi seemed to have been too preoccupied to care whether the sky had been overcast or not prior to this. Yahiko looked to Nagato. Did you find him? Nagato shook his head. I don't detect Naruto anywhere within my range. Both Conan and Yahiko's hearts dropped. He's dead. He drowned, a voice said in Yahiko's head. He's gone. Yahiko shook his head to shut the voice up. He must have just gone back to Kusa. A smart move. Let's continue the mission without him. How will we get in? Nagato asked. Conan then used her paper to form them wings like that of angels that they could use to hover down into the complex. They would ride the wind down and land on a building. From there, they climbed off the side and began to sneak about. Where should we go? Conan asked. Yahiko scoffed. To the biggest building, of course. Do you think they'd put the box anywhere else? They made their way to the building, avoiding the patrols. They would then enter. So I assume we just grab the thing and run? Nagato asked. Yahiko nodded. Simple infiltration, collection, extraction. Doesn't look simple, Conan pointed out. The box was massive. It bore the faces of what looked like lions on it. Suddenly, Nagato pointed. Look, over there. They all looked to see Naruto lying on a table. They rushed over and unstrapped him. The eight trigrams on his stomach was visible, signifying that they had tampered with it, likely drawing his chakra out. Conan lifted Naruto up and held his head as the others checked on him. He has a pulse and he seems to be healthy. He must just be low on chakra, Yahiko said. He looked to Nagato. Do you have one of those ration pills? Nagato fumbled around his many pockets until he pulled one out. Yahiko would produce a canister of water out of his own pocket. He would open Naruto's mouth and put the pill in as well as pouring in some water. Conan leaned his head back and a gentle rub to his throat caused him to swallow. They stood around him, hoping for some sign that he was okay. Eventually, Naruto's eyes opened slowly and the team let off a collective sigh of relief. Where am I? He asked. You're in Kanabi Fortress, Yahiko said. Can you tell us what happened? Naruto sat forward, capable of sitting up on his own. Uh, it's a little blurry, but after the bridge was blown, I hit the water hard and I must have hit a rock because I was unconscious. The next thing I remember was laying on the shore as a bunch of voices gathered around. They lifted me up and began to drag me away. I woke up strapped here and that guy, Nishikiyama, began to siphon my tailed beast chakra. He was putting it in the box. He was cut off as another voice spoke up. A man stepped in, his hair slicked back with a devious smile on his face. So I could have my dream fulfilled. And now you'll see it with your own two eyes. Dream? Conan asked. Nishikiyama smiled. Of course. I'm about to become a god. My wish is to become an all-powerful, immortal dragon. Yahiko rushed over. Like hell. He began to weave hand signs and let loose a massive wave of water. Nishikiyama weaved his own hand signs, and suddenly the stone floor below them rose to dam off the water. The man laughed as he then forced the ground below him to lift up towards the ceiling like a massive pillar rising from the ground. Eventually, he pressed the rock through the ceiling. Come on, we gotta follow him, Yahiko shouted. They rushed outside and began to climb up the building. They reached the top and got onto the roof. Once there, they witnessed Nishikiyama standing before the opened box. They rushed but couldn't get there soon enough. He looked into the box. And now... That which I've desired since childhood will become reality. I'll ascend and become a dragon. He stepped into the box and the box then closed. Suddenly, the box shook violently. And just then, the door opened and from within came out a massive beast, winged and feathered. Satori is what it had been called in ancient times, but now its name was lost. In a way, Nishikiyama's wish had been granted, but the box's wish had been granted as well. And from there, Nishikiyama flew around as the other shinobi of the fortress gazed upon him. Little did they know that he would be their end. He began to scoop them up and cast them into the box as well. Those that did not flee were cast into the box. The Akatsuki stood there in awe and terror at this beast. After a moment of gathering themselves, Yahiko shouted, Attack! They all ran towards their enemy. Yahiko formed a Rasengan as he looked back to Conan. Figure out how to close that box. We'll keep it distracted. Yahiko, Nagato, and Naruto all rushed forward with their Rasengan and struck Nishikiyama. Despite the level of attack, it did nothing to damage him. As they fought, Conan also defended herself while reading the inscriptions on the side. It was ancient writing, but not too different. As she read, she understood. We gotta put the beast back in. Easier said than done, shouted Naruto. She entered the fray. As they continued to fight, it was becoming obvious that Nishikiyama had the upper hand. He pushed them all back. With each of his massive feet, he pinned Naruto and Yahiko down. He grabbed Conan and lifted her into the air, preparing to devour her. In a moment of terror, Nagato screamed out and subconsciously activated his Rinnegan, making use of the diva path to push it back. It tried to stand as Nagato lifted it into the air. Naruto, Yahiko, and Conan were all surprised by this. Nagato took a deep breath as Nishikiyama came at him again. He raised his hand and utilized Almighty Push to drive it back in the box. With this done, they quickly closed it. Nagato lowered to the ground and nearly passed out. They each caught him. What was that? Naruto asked. Yahiko shrugged. Conan spoke. It was just like when we were kids. 
he managed to make use of his powers to protect us. He did it again. The fortress had been decimated by the attack, and no Iwanin were left to inhabit its walls. They would realize just how dangerous this box was, and so Nagato would make use of the Chibaku Tensei to lift it into the air and send it out into space, so that it could never be used as a weapon against mankind again. They would return to Zosui, who would refuse to pay them for not returning the box, but they were content knowing that they did the right thing. They would make their way back home, to Amegakure. They'd enter the base and take a load off the heel. It was then that they'd be approached by a man in a swirling mask. This man attempted to join their organization, but his methods stood against everything that Yahiko believed in, so he was sent away. It seems our fame is spreading, Nagato said. Yeah, for better or for worse, Yahiko would respond. They didn't truly know how bad it was though, as Hanzo of the Salamander, the shinobi they looked up to the most, was approached by Donzo Shimura of Konoha, who told him that the Akatsuki were against him, and Donzo was certain that he could prove it to them. All he needed was a little time. You see, that's the tragedy of the situation. War isn't just something you can stop with words, not always. It's why the old adage exists in the first place. If you want peace, prepare for war. Because for every person out there who wishes for peace, there is a person lusting for war. And such people are angry, violent, and aggressive. They'll do anything in their power to provoke such a war. While our hopes as peace lovers is to rise above this, this isn't always possible. And there are some people you just can't live with. This is the importance of a peaceful nation possessing a military. You can control your own actions, but you can't control others. And when wars inevitably do come, you must be ready to defend yourself. Soldiers in the civilized world are not agents of chaos, no, quite the opposite. They're agents of peace who take up their weapon and get their hands dirty so that peace may resume as quickly as possible, no matter the cost. And this hard lesson is one that the Akatsuki are about to find out for themselves. Word reaches the Akatsuki that the Hidden Stone are attacking villages outside of Ame, and so they immediately load up and begin to rush off to protect that village. There, they hope to foster peace, going so far as to tell the vengeful villagers to drop their weapons. They go off to speak with Iwa's shinobi, but instead they are attacked. It's here that Yahiko accidentally kills his first human. That hits him hard, but the fear of building in Nagato hits him hard as well. It's then that, as he summons the ghetto statue to wipe out the enemy, that Yahiko tackles Nagato and brings him back to his senses. This was all but a ploy though, and a frame job, as Danzo uses this to prove that the Akatsuki have turned against Hanzo. And so Hanzo begins to work in collaboration with Danzo in destroying the organization. All the while, Yahiko, feeling the guilt of his first kill, hopes to pass the position of leader off to Nagato, the only one he feels is capable of actually bringing about the peace they desire. It's then that Danzo appears, pretending to be an emissary of Hanzo, wishing to offer an invitation to Yahiko and Nagato. They go alone to speak with Hanzo, only for it to be revealed that it's a trap. It's then that the rest of the Akatsuki discover this fact. They inform Naruto. He looks at the message and feels his heart drop. Crap! Get all the men together, he shouts. We gotta get to Hanzo before Nagato and Yahiko! And so Naruto and his forces rush out. But before they can reach the others, they're stopped by Tobi and Zetsu, who attack them. Naruto leads the forces against those of the White Zetsu, while Kyusuke and Daibutsu rush forward to do battle with Tobi. As they fight though, Kyusuke is killed and Daibutsu perishes. Tobi rises into the air and Naruto's eyes go wide. Retreat! Get back! Suddenly, from above rains down a hailstorm of wood release spikes. Naruto and his forces are running. Suddenly, Kie, another member of the Akatsuki, jumps to cover Naruto. The spike hits Kie and passes through him, further impaling Naruto and knocking him to the ground. Naruto just lays there. It's at this time that in the distance, Nagato finds Yahiko on the end of his own blade, and it's then that their world changes forever. Nagato saw Yahiko on the end of his blade and was astonished. What had happened? Why was he dying? Why was Yahiko dying? He hadn't had the time to process it. Despite his Rinnegan being capable of witnessing even the quickest of movements as if time had slowed down, he simply could not process what had just happened. Maybe he just couldn't bring himself to believe that this was happening. His head on Nagato's shoulder, Yahiko let off a weak smile. Thank you for helping me with my dream. I pass it to you, Nagato. And with that, Yahiko fell. Nagato was in shock. He didn't understand what had happened. As he looked at the body, he found it truly unbelievable. But suddenly, the truth snapped back to him and he recognized what had just happened. And with that horrible truth revealed, his very mind shattered. With the cry, his Rinnegan activated. From below, the ghetto statue arose to heed the call of its master, all while Conan watched on in horror. Nagato! Naruto was laying there on the ground, his body covered by one of his men. He felt the hole in his stomach and the warmth of his blood leaking from within. 
his eyes began to close. A light opened to him and he thought of passing through that light. On the other side, he heard indistinct chattering, voices and laughter of people of all kinds. He heard the wind and the sound of birds chirping. It sounded like the most peaceful world he could ever dream about. He smiled, bathed in its radiance. He tried to walk through, but was stopped. It was as if an invisible wall were blocking his path. He pressed up against it, but it didn't make way for him. He was confused. Suddenly, from within the light, he saw Yahiko. Naruto looked into the eyes of his friend. Y yahiko you're dead too. I was too late. Yahiko shook his head. No, you're not too late. It may be over for me, but not for Nagato and not for Conan. I need you to hold on. Nagato's losing himself. He's scared, he's angry, and he's losing himself in his pain. I need you to hold on and remind him of who he is. Don't let him use my death as a reason to give up on the world. Naruto nodded. Yahiko hugged him. Naruto, you're like a brother to me. We lived and died together for years. I'll always be grateful. You, Nagato, and Conan were each my own little slice of a peaceful world. When I lost faith, when I needed rest, I would merely look back at you three and remember why I was fighting. I love you all. Naruto returned the embrace tightly as tears rolled down his cheek. I don't know what to do without you. Yahiko pat him on his back. You'll figure it out. You always do. And with that, Naruto was pulled away from the light and back down to Earth, where his eyes opened once more to see Conan. Naruto, she cried as she rolled the body off of him. She rolled Naruto over and saw his wound. She would use her paper to cover him in hopes of staunching the bleeding. Conan, he whispered weakly. I'm here, she said as she helped him up. She wrapped him around her shoulder and moved back to Nagato, who she had left slumped against a tree. She too put Nagato's arm around her shoulder, and with a loud grunt, just less than a cry, she lifted them up. Slowly but surely, she made it back to Ame proper, and to their base, where she lay them both down. She wheezed heavily, attempting to catch her breath. She needed to get to a doctor quickly. She knew that it wouldn't be long until Hanzo retaliated. Heck, he'd be on his way right now. But she didn't have time to worry about that. She went and found the most trusted doctor she could, one she knew was sympathetic to their now fractured cause. She brought him back to their base and left him to work on Nagato and Naruto. He began working on Naruto, who was the one bleeding the most currently. He managed to stop the bleeding and was glad to say that no internal organs were damaged. He then set upon working on Nagato, who he nearly called a lost cause. Nagato had a plethora of rods sticking out of his back. The doctor couldn't remove them as it might actually do more damage to him than leaving them in. He had so much of his chakras siphoned out that he was left looking like a skeleton wearing a thin layer of skin. His legs were heavily burned in an irreversible way. All the same, Nagato's eyes remained open. He was conscious, but was not reactive in any way. It seemed he was in shock. The doctor did what he could for him, but was honest. He's not going to be able to live like this, not without some form of help. I doubt he'll ever walk on his own again. I can't help him. Conan looked to the doctor. Hanzo's put out a hit on us. We need to get out of the village. Can you help? The man nodded. Go through the sewers. There's a secret tunnel. If you take it, it will lead you out of the village. You will need a boat to get to shore, and I can get you one, but I'll need to go ahead to prepare it. Can you get these two up? Conan nodded. The doctor looked at Naruto, who at present was getting a blood transfusion. As soon as that bag is empty, hit him with this. He gave her a syringe. This should get him back on his feet quickly. Conan thanked him. The doctor shook his head. Don't thank me yet. You're not out of the woods. Once Naruto's up, tell him to help you get Nagato into the sewers. Follow my plan. He gave her a map. This should lead you out from here. Good luck. And then he left. Conan kept an eye out for Shinobi. There was no doubt that Hanzo knew of their location by now. Special forces could be on them at any moment. She looked back at Naruto, who was nearly done with his transfusion. A proximity alarm goes off, and Conan hears it. No time! She goes to Naruto and hits him with the syringe to get him up. As the medicine takes effect, Naruto's eyes shoot open and he sits up. We're under attack, he shouts. Conan put her hand out to calm him. Yes, but we can survive this. I just need you to help me. She looks out of the door and turns the lights off. She comes to Nagato and looks him over. She walks back to Naruto and takes his yet-to-be-empty IV and takes it off the rack before taping it to his chest. Naruto looks at it and then looks at the hole in his cloak to find the bandages covering his wound. He then follows her to Nagato. Naruto, can you carry Nagato on your back? Naruto looks at his friend, barely recognizable. 
What happened to him? There's no time, Naruto. If you can carry him on your back, please do so. Naruto sighed and hauled him up onto his back with a grunt, twinges of pain radiating from his wounds. He ignored them and managed to get him up. I'm ready. Conan nodded and took out a kunai and began to lead them on. They heard the sounds of paper bombs exploding as doors came crashing down. They're already inside, she said as she changed directions. She pointed toward the hall behind Naruto. That way, go that way. Naruto began to go as Conan began to paste paper bombs to the wall and camouflage them. We need to slow them down. Naruto looked back as if waiting for her. Conan looked to him. Don't stop, keep going. Naruto, without a peep, kept going down the hall. Conan finished laying her trap. She extended it so that those not killed in the blast would find the path inaccessible. This should buy us some time, she said as she caught up with Naruto. She led him down the stairwell to the lowest floor, the basement. There were pipes lining the walls. She heard her trap go off, exploding. The building shook as concrete began to drop from the ceiling. Conan pulled Naruto back to keep him and Nagato from being struck by a rather large piece. Pay attention, she said. She led them further through until they found two large metal doors on the ground. She opened them up to reveal a ladder. She helped Naruto get Nagato off his back. She held Nagato. She looked to Naruto. Go down, I'll lower Nagato to you. Naruto began to step down the ladder. His feet landed in the water with a splash. It stank in there, but it was the smell of their final hope. Conan began to lower Nagato down with a rope. Naruto took his friend and put him on his back again. Conan too began to crawl down into the sewers. As she did, she closed the panels behind her to keep the entrance from being conspicuous. Coming down into the water, she pulled out a flashlight. She looked at her map. Come on, we need to hurry. They could be on us at any time. They began to make their way deeper through the sewers. As they did, she kept an eye out and realized that nobody was after them yet. Considering the maze of corridors and tunnels that the sewers offered, she began to feel at this point that their chances of escape had increased exponentially. As they continued to walk, they came to the end of the pipe which led to the waters outside. There was a single boat waiting for them. The doctor they trusted waved them in. Conan jumped down into it as Naruto lowered Nagato to her. She took him and moved inside so Naruto could get in. As soon as everyone was in the boat, they began to take off. Naruto sat there, wincing in pain as it seems his wounds had reopened. He took the now empty IV bag and removed it from his veins before throwing it into the water. Conan looked to him. Are you okay? He looked at her and nodded. I'll be fine, but tell me this, is Nagato okay? Conan looked at her friend who now seemed to be asleep. She pressed her fingers to his neck. Yeah, he's asleep. Naruto sighed in relief. What happened to you? He asked her. She looks down at her feet. We were going to meet with Hanzo, but it was a trap. He brought a multitude of shinobi with him and was prepared to kill us. He took me hostage and then demanded that Yahiko be killed by Nagato. Nagato didn't want to do it, but Yahiko killed himself to save me anyway. The loss awakened Nagato's Rinnegan and he summoned that statue thing again. It attached to his back with rods and he used it to effortlessly wipe out the shinobi holding me hostage. His legs were badly burned. Naruto rubbed his face as he sat forward. Yahiko. Conan was silent. Naruto looked up. He edged closer to her. You're okay, right? You're not hurt? She shook her head. Physically, no. He nodded solemnly. He rested his hand on her knee. We'll get through this. She shook her head. How? Yahiko's gone. He was our leader. Naruto thought about this for a moment. Do you remember Chibi? Conan's eyes lit up. She hadn't thought about their puppy for a long time. Naruto continued. Remember when he was killed? We thought that was the end of the world. We thought we could never move on. Remember how Yahiko told us that night that Chibi lives on inside of us, and so long as we keep his memory alive, he will be alive? Conan nodded. Naruto continued. We have to do the same with Yahiko. We will remember. We will make it through this. Conan began to cry. Naruto hugged her. The boat came to a stop at the edge of the water. They got out and began to move. We need to find a safe place to stay. Some place where we can help Nagato. The kind doctor who'd helped them escape spoke. The closest village is Kusa. Just head north and you should make it. But I don't recommend walking on foot. Not with your friend like that. There's a trading post here. If you can manage to steal a horse and a cart, it should be easier. Naruto nodded. Thank you. The kindly man smiled. Just be careful. They began to move north until they found the trading post. Conan felt bad about stealing from the innocent, but it needed to be done to save a life. Surely this was understandable. Given that she was the only one not wounded, she decided to go in alone. It wasn't all that hard. There weren't many guards. The escape had to be quick though, as a horse and cart weren't silent. 
Once she was out, she loaded Naruto and Nagato up. As they went on their way, Naruto spoke. We knew you were in trouble. We were coming to help you. Conan listened. We know you were. We found the bodies. I'm sorry you couldn't save your team. Naruto shook his head. We weren't attacked by Amenin. Conan seemed surprised. Even Nagato's eyes raised to listen to him. Naruto then spoke. That man with the swirling mask we turned away from our organization? He was the one who attacked us. Conan was confused. Wait, that Toby guy was the one who killed your team? Naruto nodded. Him and someone else. Some monstrous looking fellow, half black, half white, shaped like a Venus flytrap. They killed us, no problem. I mean, we didn't even have a chance. We couldn't even touch him. It was like he was intangible. Conan listened. I knew there was something wrong with him, Nagato growled. He and Hanzo, they're the reason Yahiko's dead. There was silence from that point on as they boiled on the situation. They eventually made it to Kusa where they enlisted the help of other medical nin. Naruto was healing fine, but Nagato needed more extensive treatment, particularly for his legs to ensure that no infection occurred. Nagato needed constant medical attention due to his wounds. This became debilitating for him after a while due to his inability to move freely, but he continued to experiment with the powers of his Rinnegan. Due to the unexpected abilities he'd displayed, he began to test the limits of his power and began to discover other ways to help himself. He asked that Conan and Naruto retrieve the body of Yahiko, their dear friend. They managed to do so with a little bit of sneakery. Nagato attempted to use his Six Paths techniques to bring Yahiko back to life, but he found the strain of such a technique too great, and knew that it would ultimately kill him if he forced it. That was something he was willing to do, but Naruto and Conan begged him not to. Despite this, he could partially resurrect Nagato using his Six Paths technique, although there was no soul within an empty shell that was only barely considered to be alive due to the Six Paths techniques he used. He would learn that, with his chakra, he could control this body as if it were his own. He spread his soul between the two. In this way, he could regain mobility while utilizing Yahiko's body. At first, Naruto was a little upset, feeling as if Nagato was using Yahiko's body in a disrespectful manner, but eventually he came to understand his true feelings. This was Nagato's way of keeping him alive. The dream had been passed to Nagato, and Nagato explained that with his Six Paths technique, he could then use Yahiko's body to complete that plan. The issue with this, however, was that Nagato could not control it over long distances. Eventually, the body would no longer be able to be controlled once it left a certain area. But the more he experimented, the better he grew, until eventually he could utilize the Ashura Path to create something for him that would allow him to be mobile even if his body didn't want to be moved. And due to this, they could continue on their way. During this time, in Kusa, they met two people, both of whom had come to know Jiraiya. One was a farmer, the living version of the Preta Path, and the other was a priest, the living version of the Naraka Path. Hoping to create the next generation of Akatsuki with which to take down Hanzo, they recruited these men. Nagato, Naruto, and Konin continued on their journeys. They ended up traveling to Takigakure where they stayed for a while. These nomads would eventually discover a man, the living version of the human path, who believed in peace, but also believed that the best thing they could do was to teach people how to survive war until peace came. Nagato and this shinobi oftentimes sparred mentally, letting their philosophies on peace clash. In the end, Nagato's own belief on peace began to shift, believing that the only way peace could be attained was by forcing war make those who would kill too scared to initiate another war by forcing them to endure pain from the last. Explaining their goals and what they had done and what they planned to do, this shinobi gave up his post to follow Nagato and his new Akatsuki. As they continued to travel, however, they came upon a certain village, and while there, Nagato witnessed a man with puppets, the living Ashura path. He was good with puppets. His combat skills with puppets were almost without peer, but he was a kind-hearted man who also used his puppets for entertainment. On many occasions, this man could be seen making children smile with his puppets, something that brought a smile to Nagato's face. He would approach this man, hoping that he would become the next member of the Akatsuki. He approached him under the guise of needing to learn puppetry. The man would witness the clunky machine Nagato was using and stated that he believed it to be too slow and energy consuming. So he built for Nagato a puppet that would carry him. 
It wasn't too fancy, but it was compact enough to be of lighter weight as well as strong enough to carry everything he needed to stay relatively healthy within the main compartment. He taught him how to control it with his chakra, something that further helped Nagato extend the distance of use he could use with his diva path by incorporating some of the techniques this man possessed, including the concept of chakra rods. He invited this man to follow him, telling him that if he did, he would eventually lead the world to peace. So the traveling puppeteer began to follow them too. Naruto and Conan began to feel a bit of kinship between these new members. As they moved on happily towards, passing through the Land of Fire, however, they're attacked by a band of thieves. These thieves are led by a Fuma clan member with a rather large scar on his forehead. The first animal path while he was still alive. He's swiftly defeated. He's revealed to have been quite a broken man. His actions during the Great War have left him broken with nothing. He almost seems to beg Nagato to kill him, but Nagato refuses, saying that he has understood pain, and tells him that he should join him and give up his life for something bigger than either of them. This man immediately agrees. From here, Nagato makes his way to Kirigakure. It's a land that reminds him of Ame a bit, and so he decides to set up shop there, taking particular missions to help sustain themselves. They become well known within Amegakure, however, and this becomes a threat to Kiri, who are now losing their work and funding to the Akatsuki, who seem to be capable of doing their missions faster and more efficiently than the standard shinobi of Kiri. This gets them on Yagata's bad side. Yagata would eventually send his seven ninja swordsmen after them. The most elite shinobi in all of Kiri were dispatched to take down the Akatsuki, and to their credit, they actually do quite well. They manage to kill most of the Akatsuki, save the three core members and the diva path. However, the tide turns in Nagato's favor when he resurrects the dead Akatsuki members to become his six paths of pain. Most of the seven ninja swordsmen were wounded and fled, all save Zabuza Momochi, who was captured by Nagato. It's revealed that Yagata had been acting strangely during this time as Mizukage, and that Zabuza was just about fed up with it. Seeing the same kind of corruption in Kiri as he did in Ame, Nagato decided that it was time that the Akatsuki stepped up and did something about it. He offered Zabuza one chance to redeem himself, stating that if he joined with the Akatsuki, they would overthrow Yagata and free his people. And in return, Zabuza would continue to serve the Akatsuki to make up for the members he'd killed. Zabuza agrees to this and begins to help Nagato form a resistance, even bringing Haku into the group. Naruto would seem a little nervous. Should we really be assisting a revolt? Don't we want to bring peace? Nagato would confront Naruto on this. We seek peace, yes, but there are many who don't want peace. Those who would stand in the way of peace need to be removed from the path. Yagata is one of those people. Naruto begins to shake his head. Nagato, I don't think this is what Yahiko would have wanted. Nagato sighs. Yahiko can't want anything anymore. Naruto shakes his head. No, Yahiko lives on inside of us. You're letting your pain eat away at you, and you're forgetting who you are, who you truly are. Nagato snaps at him. Don't try and tell me who I am. Naruto takes a step back, startled by this outburst. Nagato takes a couple deep inhalations to catch his breath. He lets off a cough. Don't try and tell me who I am. We tried it Yahiko's way and it got him killed. Naruto shook his head and looked down. What could he say? Nagato was right. Yahiko's idealistic way was so beautiful, but it had proven to be naive. Nagato was correct in saying that there were people who needed to be dealt with, people who didn't want peace, but he worried that Nagato was going too far. Together, they all made a plan. Their coup d'etat would consist of a single action, an assassination attempt. They would hit Yagata when he wasn't expecting it and attempt to assassinate him. Zabuza would explain his plan to the Akatsuki and to his own group of sympathizers. Yagata goes to this lake here to meditate. It helps him control and master his tailed beast. When he does this, he leaves most of his security detail behind, save a few. If we can get in, we can take him out. Nagato looked at the plan. With our forces, it shouldn't be too hard. Naruto looked at the plans. If we throw everything we have at him, we might actually be able to. If this is truly what you want to do, that is. Nagato ignored the last comment tacked onto Naruto's opinion. Then it's what we will do, he said. When's the next time this will occur? Zabuza looked over the schedule. It should happen at around noon tomorrow. And so they waited. Eventually, the time came, and the group set out to the lake. Nagato would head off to a secret location under the protection of Haku, while the rest of the group and the Six Paths moved on to the lake. The Six Paths of Pain, along with Naruto, Zabuza, and the Demon Brothers kept to the trees, moving. Nagato, through the Diva Path, spoke to them. When we get there, we neutralize the guard detail by any means necessary, and then we make our way to Yagata. As they perched in the trees, they looked out over their quarry. Pain utilized his rain tiger at Wiljutsu, causing it to rain, allowing him to sense anyone within it. 
I have a mark on everyone's location. There are three guards to the west, and three to the east. Yagata is already meditating on the surface of the lake. It's only a matter of time until they realize we're here. Go. And so, the group systematically made their way around the lake, neutralizing the guards. They would then step out onto the lake's surface and begin to make their way closer to Yagata, who had his back turned. They had hoped that he wouldn't notice them, but deep down in their heart of hearts, they knew he was already aware of their presence. But at this point, it didn't matter. Even if he had a tailed beast, the Six Paths of Pain, as well as Naruto and Conan, aided by Zabuza and the Demon Brothers, that made up a total of 11 shinobi, meaning that Yagata was horribly outnumbered. Yagata would sigh. I had hoped it wasn't true. He stands. I guess the mole was correct. There is a coup in the works. He looks to Zabuza. It truly is a shame. I had hoped that you wouldn't be so stupid as to turn against me after everything I've done for you. Zabuza pulled out the executioner's blade. Yagata would stand there unfazed. You've yet to realize that this is a trap, haven't you? Suddenly from under the water, the remaining members of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist arose. Behind them, Hunter Nin appeared. They were surrounded. Naruto and Conan seemed to panic a little, though Pain stood resolute, eyes full of confidence, stature declaring to the world that none would defeat him. Bring the seven ninja swordsmen. Bring ten. Bring a hundred. It makes no difference how many you bring. If I've decided you die, then you're dead, merely waiting to have your body picked up. Yagata laughed at this. You're too hilarious. It's sad that you have to die. He snapped his fingers. Suddenly, the seven ninja swordsmen, technically six right now due to Zabuza's defection, rush at the group. Naruto jumps back, seeing the group of Hunter Nin coming in from behind. He looked to Conan who spoke. Protect pain! Naruto and Conan rush towards the shinobi with their weapons, working in tandem with the demon brothers who are rushing at them as well to defend Zabuza. All the while, Pain, his six paths, and Zabuza were left to face the seven ninja swordsmen. Jinin Akabino rushed at Diva with his axe and hammer. Pain formed a chakra rod and caught the axe, but suddenly Jinin smashed the axe's blunt side with his hammer, shattering the rod. Diva dodged back and used his water release, exploding water colliding wave technique on Jinin to create distance. All the while, Raiga with his Kiba, both blades connected to the hilt, spun quickly and attacked Zabuza. Zabuza was at a disadvantage here. The Kiba blades were quick and agile, while his executioner's blade was large and harder to maneuver. This meant that Raiga had a speed advantage here. Raiga would admit how sad it is that Zabuza defected. Zabuza would mention that he had heard that Raiga himself was not content with the way the village worked, and asked him to join him instead. Raiga shook his head and said that he would not. He had to have a place to properly take care of Ranmaru, who was a disabled boy that Raiga had seemingly adopted. It was because of these similar feelings and attachments that Raiga and Zabuza had a mutual respect for each other. It was further because of this mutual respect that they refused to go easy on each other. To honor the other as the great warrior they were, they would do their best to kill one another. Kushimaru Kuriarare was engaging the animal path with his blade Noibari. The blade possessed a wire at the end of it which threatened to sew the six paths together. This was a dangerous tool, as if used correctly, it could sew all of the paths together collectively, limiting their movement and making a kill shot on all of them at once as easy as cutting a leak. Animal Path summoned its Cerberus and its drill-beaked bird. Kushimaru would use his blade to pierce the bodies of both animals and sew them together, effectively taking them out of the battle. Animal Path rose from the surface of the water, utilizing the massive centipede in its arsenal. Fuguki Suikazan, with Samehara in his grasp, would attack the Predapath, swinging his blade. Honestly, Nagato believed these two to be evenly matched. After all, Samehara's power was to absorb the chakra of any it struck, which just so happened to be the same ability as the Predapath. As the two continued to battle, Jinpachi would attack the human path with his blade, Shibuki. The human path was not the strongest, and due to this, the moment it is attacked by Shibuki, it's covered in explosive tags and detonates. Conan looks back and sees this explosion and then taps Naruto's shoulder. I'm going back to the main party. Can you handle this? Naruto nods. Go! Conan rushes across the surface of the water toward the seven ninja swordsmen. She would utilize her own paper bombs to form shuriken. Seeing Jinpachi, she would throw her tags towards him, which he would catch with his blade. Did you really think you would hit me? Conan smiled. No, because I wasn't aiming for you. Jinpachi is confused. Suddenly, he realizes that the shuriken he caught are made of paper bombs. They all detonate at once, further setting off a chain reaction within the sword, causing it to detonate as well, killing Jinpachi. All the while, Naraka Path is busy collecting the remains of the human path to feed to the King of Hell in hopes of reviving him. Conan is then attacked by Yagata himself. As Diva faces Jinin, he's pierced through the throat by a chakra rod. 
Diva grips the rod and with a quick jerk snaps his neck. Fuguki and the Predapath struggle against each other evenly. Before he can notice it, the Diva Path appears and stabs him through the heart with a chakra rod. Fuguki falls to his knees and then sinks below the waves. Zabuza falls to his knees as Raiga jumps back. Zabuza's body is covered in wounds and he's out of breath, and he knows he can't fall here. Raiga waits for his adversary to get up. All the while, Kushimaru is pushed back by a centipede. The animal path smiles. Suddenly, from below the waves, a large crab bearing Rinnegan eyes comes up, its claws gripping both Kushimaru and Raiga. Kushimaru attempts to stab through its claw, but it's heavily armored. It kills Kushimaru by severing him in two. It attempts to crush Raiga as well, in which it's mostly successful. But at the last moment, before he's severed in two, he manages to stab it with Kiba, sending massive amounts of electricity into the creature, driving it off. Raiga falls, fatally wounded. Zabaza would approach him. Raiga would cough. Damn it, I got killed. Zabaza nods. Raiga looks up. Zabaza. If you survive this, promise me one thing. Promise me on your pride as a swordsman that you will take care of Ranmaru. Zabuza nods. I'll take care of him, I promise. Raiga smiles, and with that, he takes his last breath. Zabuza lets him sink below the waves. He stands and grips the executioner's blade tightly. Yagata would slide back away from Conan. He would realize that his seven ninja swordsmen were dead. Weaklings. Fine, I'll do it myself. He then hunches over and enters his version 2 chakra cloak. Zabaza, Conan, and the Six Paths of Pain converge on each other. From behind, the crustacean that had killed both Raiga and Kushimaru would approach Yagata, hoping to do to him the same thing. Suddenly, Yagata turns and with a roar, fires a tailed beast ball strong enough to rip the massive crab to pieces. He would then rush forward and attack the group. Zabaza would swing the Executioner's Blade, which would make contact with the hide of Yagata, but upon colliding with the Crimson Shell, the blade snaps in two, leaving him open. Yagata turns to slash at Zabuza, but Divapath uses Almighty Push to blow Zabuza away from the battle to protect him. Conan stands there in awe. Nagato, how do we beat this thing? Pain looks at it. He's covered in a thick shell of chakra. We may be able to kill him if we manage to remove the shell in one place. He looks over. We'll utilize the Preta Path to weaken the shell. Then we'll use the Ashura Path to take advantage of the hole we create. We must hold it down. Together they rush the version 2 Yagata. Diva uses Universal Pull to drag Yagata to him. Ashura then rushes Yagata with a Lariat to knock him away. In each hand of the Ashura path is a paper bomb, and in the middle of his Lariat he attaches the six bombs to Yagata, meaning as soon as Yagata is done tumbling, he'll be engulfed in a fiery explosion. Yagata is left there, wounded. His shell took most of the brunt, but the concussive force seemed to break through the shell and actually hurt him, which is displayed by how much blood he coughs up. As he lays in the water, suddenly the Predapath comes from underneath and grips him from behind. He begins to siphon his chakra, which causes the shell to slowly dissipate on his underbelly. As soon as enough of an opening was created, the Ashura Path jumps into the air, forms a blade with his arm, and plunges it deep into Yagata's heart. Yagata coughs up blood as slowly his form leaves him, and in that moment, something in his eyes changes. Diva walks over along with Conan. Yagata looks into the sky. Am I? Am I free? Conan looks down with confusion. Free. Yagata smiles. I'm free from the swirling masked man's control. I'm free. He then passed away. Diva and Conan look at each other. Swirling masked man, she asks. Pain nods. It seems the root of this, Toby, go deeper than anticipated. He turns around and leaves. The battle is won and the coup is successful. Zabuza Momochi ends up becoming the new Mizukage and extends his thanks to the Akatsuki. He offers his village as a place where they can rebuild. They accept. However, Nagato tells them that it won't be like this for long. Soon, he plans to return to Ame and avenge Yahiko. And then, then he's going to turn his eyes towards the true enemy, the man in the swirling mask. Naruto threw his head over the balcony and vomited. He took a few quick labored breaths before doing it again. Conan came to him and put a hand on his back. Are you okay, Naruto? Naruto, face covered in sweat and tears, spoke. Nagato, he just, how could he do that? The rain of Amegakure poured. The village had become a war zone. The hunter nin of Kirigakure, under the order of Mizukage Zabuza, had followed Nagato and the Akatsuki back to the village hidden in the rain. The forces of Ame were hit quick and hard, a decisive victory comparable only to Order 66. And that's what it felt like. This wasn't a war, it was a slaughter. Shooting fish in a barrel. Hanzo of the Salamander was the last to fall, and his death was gruesome. So much so that merely the thought of what Naruto had seen made him puke a third time. This isn't what Yahiko would want, Naruto cried. He felt lost. 
He felt like he had lost himself, and for the briefest of moments, he sensed the so-called call of the void. His guilt had built up, and he nearly considered throwing himself over the balcony. But Conan's gentle rub on his back had become a death grip on his cloak, as if she sensed the intent. Naruto reeled his emotions in. He stood and turned to face her, face twisted in tears like they had when he was but a child. I don't know him anymore, Naruto said in a voice crossed somewhere between a whisper and a squeak. I don't know Nagato anymore. That's not who my friend was. Nagato was the guy who cried after accidentally killing a shinobi while protecting us, and now he's killing people needlessly, cruelly, without any form of respect or reverence. Conan hugged him. I know, but he's still our friend. He's hurting. He's in pain. We need to be there for him. Naruto wrapped his arms around her tighter. But when he's hurting people, starting wars, I watched children die, children like we were. When is enough enough? When's it going too far? Nothing is too far, a voice came from the doorway. They both turned and saw the diva path standing there. Naruto raised his hand. How dare you use Yahiko's body to do the one thing Yahiko would never do? I held my tongue when you chose his body as your vessel, knowing that it was your own way of keeping him alive, but now you're defiling him, desecrating his body. The diva path stood there silently. Yahiko was naive. You say that with his lips, Naruto shouted at him, accusing finger pointing even harder. Conan gripped his arm and forced it to lower before stepping between him and Nagato. Naruto, don't. Diva stood there. This was the only path to peace, Naruto. This is the hard choice. To take a life so others may be preserved. Today, I'm a devil. Tomorrow, I will be a savior. When peace reigns and war is but a distant memory, they'll thank me. Naruto shook his head. No, taking a life will never be considered a victory. How can we be agents of peace if we're warmongers? Because I am looking at this from a four-dimensional angle. I see not only what is today, but tomorrow as well, and the day after. The lives I take, the world is better off without them. Naruto pointed out to the village. I watched four kids die out there on the battlefield, crying and screaming, begging for their lives. Was the world better off without them? Would it have been better off without us? Diva stepped out into the rain. I'm making the tough call, the hard choice for peace, and you should as well. If you cannot handle the toll of peace, then maybe you shouldn't walk this path with me. Naruto stood there, silent for a moment. Conan looked back. Stop it, Nagato. Naruto's having a hard time with this and he needs time to calm down. The diva path looked at her once before turning to leave. Conan stood there silently for a moment. She looked back. Don't take what he said to heart. I think he's in emotional turmoil right now as well, even if he doesn't show it. Naruto turned around and looked over the village. Maybe he's right though. Maybe I shouldn't be walking this path anymore. Conan was startled by this. Naruto, you can't mean that. He stood there silently and looked over the village. He looked down toward the streets and felt Conan's hand cross over his, her fingers interlocking with his. Don't go. He felt his heart rate spike a little. He would be a liar to say he never had a crush on Conan, but then again, it seemed like all of their little family did. Yahiko had once, and for a while it seemed she reciprocated. This was one of the reasons it was so tragic, especially for her when he was killed. She hid it well, but he had heard her crying at night. He would just sit in bed, back against the wall, listening to her on the other side crying over his death, shedding tears of his own. Not just because Yahiko was killed, but because of how badly she was in pain from it. Nagato, for a time, had also had a crush on her, though he never said anything. And now, it was a bit too late. His heart was an empty husk, incapable of feeling anything but pain. When Yahiko died, Nagato did as well. Only the shell remained. A shell with a new creature living in it, kept alive only by its namesake. I don't want to be alone, she said as she gripped her cheek against his shoulder. Naruto turned around and gripped her by the shoulders. Run away with me. She seemed startled by that. What? Naruto repeated it. Run away with me. Let's leave this behind. Chase our dreams, our own way. She shook her head. And leave behind Nagato. I, I can't do that. He's our friend, Naruto. We can't just leave him behind. Naruto looked at her. He's not the same Nagato he used to be. He's becoming dangerous, and I don't know if I can tolerate being subjected to what he's doing. I can't go through with it. Conan took his hand and clasped it in her own once again and pressed it to her cheek. Please, don't make me choose between my two friends. Naruto suddenly felt his heart roll over on him. Okay, fine. I won't leave, but I can't condone what Nagato's doing, and I can't go through with killing anymore. I'm staying for you. I'm staying for who Nagato used to be, okay? That's the only reason. She nodded and gave him a hug. Back inside the building, Nagato sat and planned. The next step was in finding Toby. 
What were his goals? His motivations? They took stock of everything they knew about him in an attempt to guess where he was located or what he would do next. It was then that they recalled his use of the Sharingan. It could be an implant, Conan stated. An implant he never has covered. Isn't that suicide? Naruto asked, mentioning the passive energy drain. Diva shook his head. No, I've seen him shut it off. That means he's Uchiha. Naruto looked at him. Uchiha? Diva nodded. He's Uchiha, and that means he likely has a connection with Konoha. I'd say that traveling there would be a good place to start. Naruto nodded, as did Konan. Together, Naruto and Konan made their way to Konoha alongside Pain. This was a recon mission, so under the cover of night, they launched the Animal Path in, who then used summoning to bring Naruto, Konan, and Diva into the village. The Animal Path then found a place to hide. He would be their quick exit if they ever needed to make a getaway. They began to walk through the village. They headed for the Uchiha clan's cob pow to search for any clues about who Obito Uchiha might be. As they walked, Conan pointed out the Hokage Rock Monument. It's just as Jiraiya said, they carved the faces of their leaders on the stone. I wonder if Jiraiya is still alive, Naruto wondered. Conan pointed. Look, the fourth Okage. He looks just like you, Naruto. Naruto looked at the face on the rock. Huh. I wonder if there's any blood relation. Clan, maybe, Conan posited. Naruto waved it off. It doesn't really matter, I suppose. We're on mission right now. That's right, Diva said. We don't have time to get sidetracked. We have to find the Uchiha and investigate who this Tobi fellow truly is. And so they snuck their way into the compound and began to search for any clues without drawing too much suspicion. This was an issue because the Uchiha were very observant. Most of their investigation had to take place at night when most of the Uchiha were at home and asleep. In this way, they could sneak into their homes and search for any clues that might lead them in the right direction. They started with the home of Fugaku Uchiha and worked their way out to the elders. They located quite a few hidden structures that few Uchiha went to on a regular basis. One of them was the Naka Shrine. This shrine was a sacred place to the Uchiha and seemed like a perfect hiding place for an Uchiha that didn't want to be found, so they decided to pay it a visit. Once they arrived, they stepped in and found nothing. No sign of Toby, but they did find an old stone monument. Conan and Naruto both paid very little attention to this, believing it to be meaningless, but they didn't possess the Rinnegan. Diva stepped closer to the stone. What is it, Nagato? Conan asked. Diva looked closely at the stone slab. This is a relic from the era of the Sage of Six Paths. Naruto and Conan both looked at each other and took a single step forward. You mean the one who bore the Rinnegan before you? Diva looked closer at it, but as Naruto and Conan drew closer, they couldn't understand it. It's gibberish, Conan said. No, Diva replied, running his finger over each character on the stone. It's encrypted, designed to be only read by my eye. It appears to be a warning against attempting to recreate the Rinnegan. Naruto scoffed. A warning against achieving the Rinnegan that can only be read by a Rinnegan. The Sage of Six Paths doesn't seem as intelligent as we make him out to be. Despite this, Diva continued to read. Conan could tell by the look in his eye that he had found something interesting. What is it? Conan asked. Diva took a moment to continue reading, but eventually spoke. This stone contains instructions and explanations to some things. Techniques, the power of the Rinnegan, the history of the world, and a super weapon. A super weapon? Naruto asked. What kind of super weapon? Diva turned back for a moment and pointed at Naruto as his gaze returned to the stone slab. That mysterious nine tails inside of you. It's incomplete. Naruto was confused. Incomplete? Nagato continued. Your nine tails and my ghetto statue are two pieces to a larger puzzle. Every tailed beast is a piece of it. If all beasts are gathered, tails one through nine, and then placed inside of the ghetto statue, the ten tails will be born. The power of the Sage of Six Paths himself. Nagato looked it over. I must have this power. We must gain it. If we gain control of the Ten Tails, we can bring peace. And you, Naruto, you will be the key. You will be the one to bring peace with the Ten Tails. You will become a god, and then you will use your powers to make peace a reality. Naruto gulped at the concept. The Ten Tails? It sounds dangerous. Nagato nodded. Of course it's dangerous. That's why we require it. We will use it to destroy those who seek war and set a new world order. Conan looked to Naruto. She could see he was getting uncomfortable. She spoke up. Let's talk about this some other time. We still have a mission to complete. Naruto looked down and away from Diva, a cue which Nagato noticed. He lowered his finger. We'll table it for now. We should continue to search for Tobi. They continued to search, but found no sign of him. This marked the end of their time in Konoha. They set out to leave, returning to the animal path when suddenly Naruto grabbed Conan's arm. Look! He pointed out. She followed his finger and her eyes lit up a little. Master Jiraiya, 
Walking down the road like some victorious general returning home from a war, their old perverted mentor made his way home. Naruto thought about it for a moment. He looked to the others. Should we go say hi? Diva looked at his hands. No, I don't want him to see me like this. Diva looked up at Naruto. If he knew Yahiko was dead and that I was injured as grievously as I am, it would ruin his day. It's best we leave him. This saddened Naruto, but he looked to Conan and recognized that she felt the same way. It was best to let sleeping dogs lie. To be able to see him happy and alive was enough to make Naruto happy, even if he couldn't interact with him. Together, they made their way out. They checked on the other various sites that the Uchiha had set up, but there was no sign of Tobi. Disappointed, they returned to Amegakure. Well, we can't simply sit around and do nothing. We have our opportunity to begin something new, something important. I believe we should shift our focus to that and leave Tobi be until he proves himself to be a bigger threat. Nagato stated, For now, we must gather the tailed beasts. How do we plan to do that? Conan asked. We take them, Nagato said with cruel indifference. Naruto looked up at Nagato, But we can't. Some of these beasts already have hosts. If you separate them from their tailed beast, they'll die. Diva looked to Naruto for a moment before turning away and making a stride toward the throne Hanzo had left behind. He sat down upon it. A small price to pay for world peace. We'll be disarming the five great nations and setting up a deterrent to end the suffering of the world. What is one or two lives in the face of millions? A necessary sacrifice. They won't be forgotten for their sacrifices. Any man would be pleased to know that their forfeiture of their life brought an end to war as a whole. Naruto was startled by what he heard. We're gonna commit more murder? Pain looked at him. It's a hard call, Naruto. You desire peace, don't you? Naruto gulped and nodded. Diva offered a softer gaze. Then, sometimes a sacrifice must be made. For them, it's their lives. For us, it's our conscience. They'll have to die for what we must do, and we'll have to live with what we must do. It's the price we must pay. Naruto looked down and then away with a gasp of a sigh, showing that he was nearing his limit. He didn't want to do this again. Conan's sympathetic gaze met his for a time. Nagato looked to both he and she. If you desire, you may continue the search for Tobi instead. With my Rinnegan and my Uzumaki clan spirit, I'm better suited for capturing the tailed beasts. You focus on Tobi. Make sure he doesn't get in the way of our plans. Conan nodded. She took Naruto by the hand and began to lead him out, a gesture Nagato noticed. As they walked down the halls, Naruto looked to her. I don't know if I can go through with that. Conan nodded. I think Nagato knows that too. It's why he's decided to do it himself. To spare you. Just look away, Naruto. We can't help this. It's our big chance at world peace. We need to reach out and take it without fear, even if it hurts. Naruto looked away from her. What would Yahiko say if he were here right now? Conan thought about it. You know as well as I do what he would say. Naruto faced her again. Then why are we doing this? Conan thought about it for a moment. Because it's the right thing to do. And so, together, they continued their search for Tobi. It took them quite some time, but eventually they would be contacted by Zabuza Momochi, the current Mizukage of the village hidden in the mist. He would inform them that Tobi was moving again, and that he was detected by Kiri's hunter Nin poking his nose about Kirigakure. And so, Naruto and Conan began to investigate within the confines of the village. What were they there for? Was it because they were attempting to gain better political footing? Perhaps destroy Zabuza's regime? What could it be? They kept their eyes open both day and night for Tobi and the mysterious man that they had only come to know as Zetsu. As they sat there, they spoke. So, how are you feeling? Conan asked. Naruto sat there on his perch overlooking Kiri. Like, I don't have a purpose anymore. Conan cocked her head. How so? Naruto, anguished, attempting to find the proper way to articulate what he meant. This isn't Yahiko's way anymore. I don't know if I want the kind of peace Naruto is bringing. Conan was surprised by this. What do you mean by that? Naruto hopped down from his perch and stood there on ground level. I mean, I see how he's been leading Ame. People are scared of him. He rules with fear. People aren't fighting because they're scared of what he'll do. That's a symptom of a tyrant. I'm scared that if this continues, we'll end up subjugating the world under an iron rod as opposed to freeing them from war. She stepped forward. You're a good man, Naruto. I know that if such a world does come to pass, then you'll offset Nagato. You'll be the people's advocate, the new sage of six paths. Naruto sighed. I just don't think I can keep going at it Nagato's way. I know he's not having me kill any of the Jinjuriki, but I'm watching it happen. Blood is being spilt, and I just can't help but feel like we're spitting in the face of Yahiko and everything he's built. I know I talk about this a lot, but I can't help but feel bothered by it. Surely you understand, I just... She pushed her lips forward and kissed him, stopping his rambling all at once. 
At first, Naruto was surprised, nearly recoiling, but slowly he melted into it, his eyes closing. She pulled away. Just take a breath, Naruto. You're letting your stress get the better of you. It'll all work out in the end, and I'm sure that what we achieve will be enough to please Yahiko. Naruto looked away for a moment. I hope you're right. Suddenly, they saw two shadows dart from one rooftop to the next. Conan and Naruto looked to each other. Let's go after them, she said. They jumped out and began to chase after the shadowy figures. As they did so, they tried to keep their distance so as to not be seen. They followed for a time before the two shadows slipped into the sewers. They followed them down and chased them through the runoff. Turning a corner, they were surprised to have been met by a dead end. Turning around to leave, they saw not two, but four dark shadows, each of them wearing a black cloak with red clouds. They were surprised. Toby stepped forward, Zetsu by his side. How easily you are baited. What do you mean? Naruto asked. Toby clicked his tongue. I suppose you wouldn't know, would you? You think I had anything planned here in Kitty? It has no use for me any longer. Not since Yagata was killed. No, I made myself visible just enough to lure you here and kill you myself. Conan looked around. I see you have new friends. Toby looked back. Indeed I do. Meet the newest recruits of my own personal Akatsuki, Hidan and Kakazu. One an immortal warrior of Jashin, and the other an assassin who nearly killed the first Okage. Naruto put his hand in front of Conan and pushed her back. Stay back. I'll take them. Conan's eyes widened. No, you can't handle them yourself. Naruto shook his head. No, I can. I just, I don't know if I'm ready to handle this, so please, step back. Toby cocked his head slightly to the right. Oh, are you going to show off your tailed beast? Yes, give me a preview of my prize. Naruto got down on all fours as suddenly the version 1 cloak appeared around him. It then evolved into his version 2 cloak, and with a mighty roar, he rushed the four Akatsuki. He passed right through Toby, and before he could touch Zetsu, Zetsu melted into the floor. Hidan bore his scythe and attempted to slice into Naruto, but the shell of the version 2 cloak was too tough to pierce through. Kakazu utilized his Earth Grudge Fear technique to form massive tendrils of what appeared to be sewing thread before wrapping it around its body and lifting him into the air with it. Damn it, my threads can't break through the shell. What did you think was gonna happen, dumbass? Hidan said as he checked the slightly blunted edges of his scythe. If my scythe can't get through it, what makes you think your silly string can? Suddenly, Zetsu appeared on the ceiling. He would utilize wood release to knock Naruto to the ground. Naruto would be held there. Zetsu attempted to add more pressure to shatter the shell, but before he could, the thrashing Naruto settled for a moment and released a tailed beast ball straight at him. Zetsu narrowly avoided it, though the entire ceiling of the sewage tunnel was blown out, along with much of the surrounding streets. Naruto broke free and once more rushed at Hidan, this time managing to slice him up, even severing an arm to which Hidan's reaction bore no pain or fear. The battle continued. As Toby came up from behind Naruto, he went to strike, but suddenly Conan stopped him and attempted to destroy him with her paper bombs. Before she could, he retreated into his Kamui dimension to escape the blasts. The battle raged on for quite some time, both parties getting tired out. It was at about this time that the Hunter Nin, led by Haku, appeared. Toby's Akatsuki would flee the scene. Naruto called back his cloak and fell to the ground, his body severely burned, many of his cells damaged. Conan ran to him. Naruto! She held him up. He lay there motionless, alive but unconscious. The hunter nin rushed to his side. Haku stepped up to them and looked down upon Naruto. Get him to the hospital, ASAP. Naruto was rushed to the hospital where he would undergo intensive treatment to repair the effects of his version 2 cloak. All the while, Conan contacted Pain immediately. What is it, Conan? asked the oily, transparent figure of the diva path. We were attacked by Toby. He and the one known as Zetsu have two new compatriots, one known as Hidan, a priest of Jashin, and the other Kakazu, a survivor from the first Shinobi World War. They fled, but I managed to place a tracking tag on them. Pain listened. Where is Naruto? Conan was silent for a moment. He's unconscious right now, in the hospital. He utilized his version 2 cloak and was nearly killed. Pain was silent for a moment. I will be there shortly. After some time, Nagato appeared in Kiri and met up with Conan. Show me where Toby is. She would show him a place on the other side of Konoha, a place known as the Mountain's Graveyard. My tag insinuated that the base is located here. Pain nodded. Stay here, Conan. I will deal with them myself. Conan looked up. But will you be okay? He looked back at her. My true body is nearby. Defend it. My six paths will strike first. She nodded. The rest of the six paths of Pain appeared by the Diva Path. The six figures then infiltrated the base. At this moment, Toby was plotting with the other members of the Akatsuki. They too were planning to retrieve the tailed beasts in an attempt to reform the Ten Tails. And this meant that they would eventually need the Rinnegan, which meant that Nagato was on their hit list. But they were unaware that he was already in the building up until he and his six paths rolled up. Ah, 
Seems like we're both going about the same goals then, Nagato said through Diva that was looking at the plans Toby had set up. The other members of Toby's Akatsuki began to grow defensive. However, Toby himself remained relaxed. Ah, the third Six Paths graces us with his presence, saves us the trip back to Ame to take your eyes. And what makes you think you could ever take my eyes, Nagato asks, pulling a map from the wall and looking it over. They stood in awkward silence for a time. Nagato looked up. I've not forgiven you. Toby stands there, his eye glowing crimson from below his mask. Nagato continued. I've not forgiven you for your hand in the death of Yahiko. It's as much your fault as it is Hanzo's. More so, perhaps, as not only did you stop my people from saving us, but you killed them too. Your act was unforgivable, and I've been waiting for the moment to finally make you feel pain. Toby let off a slight chuckle. Hatred enough to match even that of an Uchiha. Perhaps your borrowed eyes still bear some of their master's will. But alas, I'll be needing them back now. Nagato smiled, then come and try to take them. With that, the Six Paths of Pain and Toby's Akatsuki began to do battle. Hidan came in and was met with the Human Path. The Human Path lunged towards Hidan, but Hidan struck it with his scythe. Despite this, the Animal Path showed no sign of slowing down. Hidan lifted the Animal Path over his head and smashed it into the ground. He then pulled the blade back to lick the blood, but found none. What? Toby looked back. Don't bother, it's a corpse. Hidan knew that his damage transferring techniques would be impossible on this being, but he still held the advantage. His immortality would ensure that he could not be killed and therefore could survive whatever this being had to throw at him. He just needed to damage it enough. For a time, Hidan and the Human Path fought, but it would soon be a decisive victory. Nagato had not chosen the Human Path for nothing. Despite Hidan's perceived immortality, that didn't mean he couldn't truly die, and all that he needed to do was remove the soul. When the Human Path got close enough, he managed to reach out and grip Hidan, where he then pulled his soul clean from his body, leaving him on the ground dead. All the while, Kakuzu was facing the Ashura Path along with the Animal Path. To make things more fair, Kakuzu utilized his four masks to create four warriors beside him out of threads. To this, the Animal Path summoned its animals, while the Ashura Path focused on Kakuzu himself. The battle was pretty straightforward. All they needed to do was strike their hearts and kill them. With the power of the Rinnegan, finding these hearts wasn't too much of an issue, and with the superior firepower of the Ashura Path, before Kakuzu even had a chance to retaliate, he was struck and killed. The battle then came down to Zetsu and Tobi against the Diva Path and the Preta Path. The Preta Path attempted to take on Zetsu, while Diva attempted to take on Tobi. Tobi would come at Nagato. Nagato would throw his chakra rods at Tobi, but before they hit, Tobi phased through them. Nagato recalled Naruto's words that Tobi was like a ghost. He groaned and prepared to receive a strike. He was knocked back. Suddenly, from within the Kamui dimension, Tobi pulled out the gun by Uchiwa, a legendary weapon passed down from generation to generation, last used by the great Madara Uchiha. Or so Nagato had read. Did this mean that this man was Madara Uchiha? No. Impossible. Madara would have to be over a hundred years old by now. But then again, he had seen far crazier things. He would weave his hands into signs. Thanks to his Rinnegan, he had a natural affinity for all five nature transformations. Due to this, he chose a fire-style jutsu to use against Tobi. Releasing a great fireball technique as a bit of an insult to Tobi due to his Uchiha heritage, he found himself surprised when his jutsu was turned to wind style and redirected back at him. He was blown back. He hit the wall and managed to stand. Tobi once more rushed at him. He utilized Almighty Push to knock Tobi back. He came closer. It seemed that he was still weak to this. He wondered why that was. In all actuality, the reason for this is because Tobi generally couldn't phase his whole body through something, and would only pass through Kamui to escape something of such an area of devastation as this. It truly was hacks, but it hardly made him as invincible as Pain was coming to learn. Pain would then have his six paths converge on both Tobi and Zetsu at the same time. The focused effort was enough to overtake and kill Zetsu, but Tobi was still holding his own. That was until he was surrounded by the entirety of the Six Paths of Pain. There was nothing he could do, and in the end, he too was struck down. As he lay there dying, he looked up at the Diva Path. I had hoped to stop something like you. I had hoped to eradicate pain from the world, but all I did was give birth to its embodiment. And now, the world will burn with the rest of us. Toby then passed away. Eventually, Naruto would wake up in the hospital. Conan would be by his side. She would tell him that Nagato found and eliminated the opposing Akatsuki faction and that they could now focus on their primary mission, which was to take the tailed beasts. 
This was not something Naruto would do. He drew the line there and told Pain that he wasn't going to kill the Jinchuriki, and so he would only be sent after Isobu when he regenerated. Naruto, along with Zabuza and Haku, would capture Isobu and bring him back to the Ghetto Statue to be sealed. After some time, with very little resistance, they managed to capture all nine of the tailed beasts. They sealed eight within the Ghetto Statue, but one was left, and Naruto knew that this meant it was time to seal the Ten Tails into himself to bring the peace they had fought so hard for. Naruto entered the chamber where the Ten Tails was sitting. He looked up at it and saw eight of its nine eyes open. He possessed the final key. Now all he had to do was seal it into himself and merge the Nine Tails with it to take the power of the Sage of Six Paths and end war altogether. Remember, you're going to keep peace. You're going to promote freedom. You won't be a tyrant. Conan watched. Nagato looked out to Naruto and spoke. It's time now for you to seal the Ten Tails into yourself, Naruto. Once you do, we will march on Konoha and eradicate it. In doing so, we will show the world that none can oppose us. They'll have no choice but to accept peace. Naruto looked at Nagato in surprise. Wait, we're going to eradicate an entire village. Nagato's eyes narrowed. Yes, we will. Naruto was in shock. He could hardly articulate what he wanted to say, the questions he wanted to ask. But Nagato, you told me that we would be a deterrent. The threat of our power would stop people from going to war. You said nothing about mass murder. Naruto let out a light sigh. The people will not fear a weapon they do not know truly exists. The only way for this to work is to make an example out of one of the warmongering villages, and right now the biggest is Konoha. We must prove that even a world superpower cannot stand against us. Naruto shook his head. No. Nagato raised an eyebrow. No. Naruto looked at him. No, Nagato. I won't do it. I... I can't. I'm drawing the line here. Nagato was awestruck by this. How can you say no? We've been working so hard for this. Peace is right there in our grasp. All we have to do is take it. Naruto cringed slightly when Nagato raised his voice at him. No, Nagato. I've made plenty of compromises since Yahiko died and you took the wheel. I am not going to kill thousands just to prove a point. Nagato wasn't sure what to do. You're a fool. You're too weak to take the chance at peace right before us. You plan to let the world suffer and rot in the throes of war just because you're too weak? How long will it be until the fourth Shinobi World War? The fifth. War will continue to come and millions will perish, and you can stop that now if you have the strength to make a hard decision." Naruto shook his head again. I won't do it, Nagato. I can't. I'm sorry. Nagato roared at him in anger and thought about it while trying to catch his breath. You have to make the hard decision. It's the only one left. We didn't come this far to gain nothing, he said. Naruto looked up. I am making the hard decision. The decision not to follow your orders. Pain looked up at Naruto. I wasn't talking to you. Suddenly, the six paths of pain converged on Naruto as Nagato's walker drew closer. Naruto, I always admired you, ever since we were children. You rescued me. Without you, I would be dead right now, and maybe if I were, I wouldn't have felt such pain. But now, I have the chance. The chance to do that great thing that my mother's voice told me to do. When I was denied entrance into heaven and sent back to this hell, my mother told me that I still had great things to do. And this is that great thing. Please, Naruto, take the ten tails. Save the world. Naruto shook his head again. No, not if I have to bloody my hands with the lives of the innocent. Thousands of people will perish. I won't be the one to kill them. Nagato let out a laugh, a hysterical laugh, one that slowly devolved into tears. Why are you doing this? Why are you making me kill you? Naruto offered a slight smile. Because it's the hard choice. Nagato grit his teeth. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Nagato's Rinnegan widened, and from the ghetto statue, violent chains were fired. They wrapped around Naruto and lifted him into the air. If you're going to make a hard decision, then I will too. I can't afford to lose this chance. Naruto felt his tailed beast being ripped from his body, and in that moment, he saw Yahiko looking down upon him, his eyes light and his mouth in a gentle smile. There was the sound of steel passing through flesh and bone, and suddenly, Naruto dropped. He hit the floor hard and took a deep breath gasping at the sweet, life-giving oxygen that floated around him. He looked up and saw Conan standing on Nagato's walker, a blade in her hand, the tip passing through Nagato's chest. C conan what have you done? Nagato cried out. She had tears running down her cheeks as she pulled the blade out. She pulled Nagato into an embrace, her tears mingling with his. He looked to her. Why? Her eyes opened as she spoke. I had to make the hard decision. Slowly, the six paths of pain began to fall one by one until the only path left was the seventh. 
the outer path, Nagato himself. Naruto stood and walked over. Nagato's eyes glazed a bit, and for a moment he was returned back to that time and age long past, that age during the Second Shinobi World War. He looked down and saw his own tiny feet, caked in mud and dirt, trudging down the long and lonesome road to his own demise. Before him, the tiny Nagato witnessed the Shinigami his parents had spoken of so long ago, the Reaper. He felt so empty, so tired. He fell to his knees and laid there, face first. However, as he laid there, he felt two sets of hands on his back, rolling him over. He saw two heads, one with yellow, the other purple. They held him up in an embrace. Their eyes possessed tears in them as they held him. I'm so sorry, Nagato, the girl with lavender hair said. She held him in her embrace, wailing uncontrollably. The other hand was gripped by the blonde boy, who also had tears running down his face. It felt like at any moment, the weak tether keeping his soul tied to his body might be released, and he might pass on to the next life. As he laid there, a third boy appeared. This boy possessed orange hair. He didn't cry, however. He only smiled. Yeah, Hiko. Nagato spoke through gurgles. A hand reached down to him. Nagato raised his hand and took it, standing up. And in that moment, all pain subsided. The pain was gone. And in reality, Naruto and Conan held the lifeless body of their friend. Pain was gone. A few years pass. Naruto was out in the field tilling the land. He looked up into the sky at the sun and felt the sweltering heat. Looks like the rain's about to come, he said, as he looked back to see Conan standing there holding a bento. It's so rare to have a sunny day in Ame, she said. Even if the rain returns, let's enjoy the sunshine while we can. He turned to her and took the box. Do you have the produce ready for the market, he asked. Yeah, I got it done a little quicker than normal. The kids decided to help out this time. Naruto laughed. That's a shocker. In the time since Nagato's death, Naruto and Conan had decided to focus more on the peace that they could find personally instead of worrying about the world. And in that time, they had settled down and started a little family of their own. In that time, they were blessed with two sons. One they named Yahiko and the other Nagato. And despite the tensions in the world still building up, something Naruto knew would eventually reach a breaking point, he knew it would be okay. It always was. It was the circle of life, and in that circle, death existed. But just as the perennial plants seemed to die in the winter and resurrect in the spring, so too did humanity fall into the cold embrace of war and then rise from the ashes like a phoenix. Naruto knew that he couldn't control what others did, and even if he had gone with Nagato's plan, that wouldn't have ended suffering. True peace was something one needed to find personally. It couldn't be forced down your throat. Every man, woman, and child needed to choose it on their own, and Naruto had chosen peace. And he knew, eventually, that he wouldn't be the only one. And that's the end of the story. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a bit of a downer at the end there, but it's just something that had to happen. Nagato wouldn't give in, and neither would Naruto. At that point, Naruto had realized just how far he had drifted with his compromises, and how far Nagato had drifted as well. Having fallen from the ideals they all once shared so long ago, they found themselves lost in a sea of pain without a life preserver. But anyway, what did you think of the video? Did you enjoy it? If so, be sure to click that like button. And what's that? You have critiques about the video? Perhaps something you want to see sometime else? Wonderful. Tell me in the comments. I love to hear from you. Anyway, I'll see you in the next video. Until then, peace out. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi. And make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.